Desastres naturales se han hecho más frecuentes en los últimos años. Solo en 2020 se registraron 66 grandes catástrofes en la región que afectaron a unos 10 millones de personas. No hace falta decir que los desastres tienen un impacto negativo en nuestras actividades socioeconómicas. Por lo tanto, es un reto importante para la región que los ciudadanos, comunidades y los gobiernos trabajen juntos para crear una sociedad resiliente a los riesgos de desastres. Los países de América Latina y el Caribe han realizado importantes esfuerzos para desarrollar e implementar una serie de políticas públicas destinadas a reducir la vulnerabilidad frente a los eventos de desastres en las décadas anteriores, en las que el BID ha sido un aliado clave apoyando técnica y financieramente muchas de estas iniciativas innovadoras. En este contexto, y como parte de esa evolución, nos gustaría introducir las ciencias del comportamiento. La incorporación de las ciencias del comportamiento en la gestión de riesgos de desastres permitirá analizar en profundidad los retos a los que se enfrentan los ciudadanos, las comunidades y las organizaciones e instituciones y abre la puerta a formas aún más efectivas de planificar e implementar políticas de gestión del riesgo de desastres. Por esto hoy les damos la bienvenida a este nuevo diálogo regional de política para la gestión de riesgos de desastres naturales del BID donde profundizaremos en estas ideas y veremos algunos casos donde las ciencias del comportamiento ya están siendo aplicadas con éxito. En nuestras manos está la capacidad de impulsar mejores políticas que contemplan las motivaciones de las personas y resulten en una mejor gestión de los riesgos en la región. Bienvenidos. Bueno, muy buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. I would like to extend to you the most cordial welcome to this second day of our regional policy dialogue in behavioral sciences, concentrating this year on behavioral sciences, improving the effectiveness of disaster risk management policies. And in order to kick uh, this off, I'd like uh, to remind us all both for the benefit of those who were here present yesterday and those who were not. The main takeaways from yesterday, it was a very productive and very interesting day. Yesterday was a day where we had the three major presentations. And then we had a brief space at the end of the day for breakout rooms and teamwork. And during the presentations, we got the several elements on behavioral sciences and how these can be applied to different uh, moments in uh, disaster risk management. And the first one was by Carlos, who spoke about uh, how at some point we are all or could uh, fall prey to different psychological biases or cognitive uh, biases. And amongst uh, these, we could uh, stress as highly relevant, not because the others are less, but these are or could be more frequent is a fear to lose fatigue in decision-making, social norms, and overconfidence or excess confidence. And then after we analyzed what was these behavioral sciences are and what the biases are and how they can affect us in our decision-making process, we followed uh, Marco's uh, presentation, seeing some examples on how these decisions are made and what is the impact that they have on the way we deal with disaster risks. And we saw that there are two different decision-making types, type A and type B. 
type A, which are a bit faster and intuitive, and type B, which are more, much more logical. And after that, with Emiliano's presentation, we saw how music and the different the visual aids can help us transmit important messages for prevention of these risks. And it showed us uh, several very interesting examples and a beautiful video that left uh, quite um, an imprint uh, on us uh, from Haiti and how these uh, tools, music and all the other visual auditive elements can help us uh, so that uh, when we have uh, to make uh, type A or type B decisions, so we can make uh, a better decision at the end of it all. And this is something that we saw yesterday, then we worked in uh, teams and we tried to identify in our countries what psychological biases we can identify which are recurrent and which uh, come up when the community makes a decision when dealing with a, a risk mitigation action. And today we'll delve much more into this and we have the two major moments let us move on to the next uh, slide on the agenda. We have two big moments today. For the first one, we'll have a panel where we will take a look uh, at the use of general framework uh, of these behavioral sciences for these uh, risk reduction measures in different geographies in our beautiful region. And this uh, panel will be moderated by Luisa Calactiva and we will have uh, four panelists, a very interesting panelist with us. And we will also have another big moment uh, over an hour work in groups, and then a brief uh, period uh, to share the results where we will delve uh, deeper into this uh, based on a hypothetical case uh, and uh, take a look at the enforcement of these uh, behavioral sciences in identifying actions that we can take in order to reduce the risk of disasters in our neck of the woods, in our geography. So that second moment, let us follow this closely. And if for every reason, for whatever reason you need a break, do it before this. We will break into groups at 10, 15 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. And it will be very interesting. So please follow this closely, be here and participate actively. El primero, por favor. Two final comments. The first one, please, those of you who know how to do it, please help us placing before your name the two initials that you use to identify your country. If it is Colombia, CO, if it is Paraguay, PY, if it is Argentina, AR, please include the two initial letters of the country before your name to assist us in the identification of each one of you so that we can assign you to the different breakout rooms. And if you come from the IDB, just let us know that you come from the IDB. And to conclude, uh, special greetings uh, to the people from Barbados. I know that this uh, week you've been celebrating, so special greetings uh, from us uh, on behalf of the Inter-American Bank and all participants in uh, congratulating you for your independence. Our best uh, wishes in this uh, new stage uh, that uh, Barbados uh, is beginning. I hope that it will be very positive and of great benefits for all of you. Well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the moderator of our panel, Mr. Yuri Chakala, who's a lead specialist, sector specialist in the Division of Environment, Rural Development and Disaster Risk Management, responsible for this dialogue. And we will be working with him and uh, with very, very interesting uh, top level panelists, uh, these uh, studies uh, in using these behavioral sciences and disaster risk management measures in our region. So let me give you Yuri so that he can take the floor. And from now on, Yuri will be the moderator. So welcome, Yuri. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, good morning and welcome again, everyone. Um, in format, as for the agenda, we, we have a panel presentation focusing on specific approaches and the state of progress for two case study countries, the Bahamas and Ecuador, which are both trying to incorporate behavioral science into their disaster risk reduction efforts. 
I'll introduce the panelists and ask them a question or two each. In response, they will share brief presentations of their experiences of the countries with which they're involved, their observations, findings, and lessons learned. After we hear from the panelists, towards the end of the session, we will then move on to an open question and answer discussion on possible future approaches in participating countries. You can post your questions uh, to the chat. Before I formally introduce the panelists, uh, please permit me a word of general reflection with respect to situational context. As a DRM professional that has been involved in the Caribbean community of practice for a while, I think it is important to indicate that the consideration of behavioral approaches is relatively young or incipient, but is nevertheless exciting and presents a significant positive opportunity to improve our effectiveness and even efficiency. This is a new and rapidly evolving field. Public agency approaches at communication and outreach to key vulnerable population groups have traditionally made assumptions. The assumptions are that such groups would act on the information once received to secure their personal and familial safety in the way advised in relation to imminent hazards. Often, as public authorities, we tend to presume or assume that groups to which public safety advisories are issued will internalize the messaging accordingly and act in a rational way. This isn't always the case. Many DRM assessments also consider human behavior as constant over time, but it really is dynamic. As we're coming to realize and understand there are an additional range of influencing factors that determines people's choices and behaviors in relation to securing or increasing their safety from hazards. Yesterday, as Daniel outlined, we identified several of them, short-sightedness, overconfidence, status quo bias, simplification, hurting behavior, etc. There is thus tremendous benefit to diving deep and, the, and, and into the understanding and learning much more about the behavioral biases, preferences, insights that such groups may exhibit and or even structural challenges that they may experience for them to act on the messages received. It is also important that disaster risk managers and their public outreach communication staff consider just how to increase their team's capacity to better embrace, utilize, monitor such approaches going forward. I think as a priority as DRM practitioners, we should seek to increase our understanding of the principles of application of behavioral sciences, and as well our efforts to evaluate mainstream and even amplify such considerations in communications outreach programming efforts. Through the engagement mechanism, of our country offices, we stand ready as IDB to see how best we may support and advance these approaches within DRM. Now for the panel. Treating to and sharing the Bahamas experience today, we have with us Ms. Raquel Peters and Mr. Emiliano Rodriguez Nuesh. Uh, and I'll do a little bit of introduction of the panelists. Raquel is an administrative associate and social media coordinator of the Office of Disaster Management in the Office of the Prime Minister of the Bahamas. Raquel specializes in disaster management and disaster communication and marketing. And Emiliano, as you would have all been familiar with yesterday if you were here, uh, is a consultant behavioral communication specialist and director of communications with the agency Pacifico. Emiliano, has undertaken consultant work in behavioral communication science for IDB, World Bank, NASA, the City of Los Angeles, New Orleans, the US Geological Survey, and the Japanese International Cooperation Agency. 
And with respect to Ecuador, treating and sharing to the Ecuadorian experience today, we also have with us Senora Diana Salazar and Senor Ricardo Peña Herrera. Diana is a Director of Policies and Standards in Risk Management in the National Service of Risk and Emergency Management in the Government of Ecuador. And Ricardo is a Senior Specialist Consultant in Disaster Risk Management with 25 years of experience in different areas of DRM with emphasis on seismic risk. He has served as a Metropolitan Director of DRM in Quito, Ecuador, as well as the Undersecretary of Information Management and Risk Analysis and Program Manager for Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Preparedness with the Humanitarian Aid Office of the European Commission. So as you can see today, we have quite a stellar cast um, and maybe I can start off with uh, Raquel. Uh, Raquel, the Bahamas has been hit by several frequent hurricanes in recent years, including Hurricane Dorian in 2019. Uh, two questions, really. Uh, what DRM policies uh, or measures does the government of Bahamas have in place? And what, what are the challenges in improving the effectiveness of these policies? And how, how might be behavioral science being, being used in this regard? That's a great question. So, as far as good morning, everyone. I'm sorry. As far as what DRM policies and measurements we have in place, so we have the Disaster Preparedness and Response Act, the National Disaster Plan for Emergencies, the Disaster Reconstruction Authority Act, the NGO Information Booklet, the Restore Island Keys or RIC exercise, and policies that are developed by each organization that's involved in disaster management. So because of our archipelagic nature, we follow a more Americanized approach to CDM, particularly for disaster response. So we have 14 thematic groups and each one is responsible for a different aspect of disaster response with one government agency to lead and a collection of other support agencies that work together to facilitate that disaster response. This leaves each agency with the responsibility to develop and update their own disaster management policies that we discuss on a monthly basis in our disaster consultative committee meetings. This doesn't mean that NEMA itself, the National Emergency Management Agency itself, doesn't also have its own policies. So in addition to that, we also have the after action review, which is an exercise that we hold after each major event or major disaster. In our case, it's typically a hurricane because of our location in which all stakeholders come together and identify what went wrong, what went right, and how we could really improve our disaster response. Um, we did this by examining all of the factors separated into different thematic groups, again, be it tactical, policy, structural, and operational. And we assigned timelines to each of these tasks and identified different organizations that would be key to completing the task. From this, we were able to make updates to the National Disaster Plan. We were able to create the NGO information booklet. We created a digital situation reporting platform that's ideal for remote communication of needs and the general goings on on the ground. And of course, we created two new organizations that work collaboratively with NEMA to facilitate comprehensive disaster management. So in addition to NEMA, which already focuses on preparedness and response. We have the Disaster Reconstruction Authority that focus, focuses on reconstruction, rebuilding and debris management. And of course, the Office of Disaster Preparedness, which focuses more on policy. So the challenges in improving the effectiveness of all of these policies are mostly communication related because each agency has to create its own policies along with NEMA. It's one of the challenges is ensuring that each organization communicates the relevant changes to each other so that we can effectively coordinate disaster response and bring awareness of any changes that were made to disaster policies from a NEMA level, ensuring that all stakeholders know how and when to use these policies and that the policies themselves are inclusive of all marginalized groups. And finally, as far as how is behavioral sciences being used in this regard, so in addition to the 
study with Emiliano and Pacifico, sharpening disaster communications by applying behavioral insights. We've also put increased emphasis on early warning systems through a program called Weather Ready Nations, which focuses on the identification of vulnerable populations and areas based on mapping information, and then using that information to evaluate how we can communicate with the public or with members of those vulnerable communities to inspire and empower people effectively so that they can adequately prepare their homes and businesses. Because understanding how behaviors and the complexity of people's decisions before and after a hurricane or disaster um, is key to making risk communications more effective, which Emiliano has already touched on at some point. Excellent. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you very much. I, I think um, this is really encouraging that um, Bahamas is one of the first countries in the region kind of embracing this behavioral approach in its, in its disaster risk management. So, so congratulations on that. And um, thanks, thanks for the responses. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Okay, Emiliano, um, considering the, the challenges that the Raquel mentioned with respect to the government of the Bahamas um, and the fact that IDB is, is working with you to conduct some research and make recommendations for improvement. Could you tell us a little bit about the approach that you're taking, um, what, what you've learned so far and what improvements might you be proposing from, from the work that you've done so far? Of course. Thank you, Yuri. Good morning and good morning, everyone. I'd like to share a few of the highlights of a process that has been truly a, a team effort and a, a teamwork. Uh, I directed a, a team of nine people that worked in this process, but also the collaboration and work with Hori, with Raquel, with Deborah, with Indiria, with Sireta in, in IDB Bahamas has been uh, really, really important. Um, and I'd like to share a few slides to get a bit, to get, get deeper into some of the findings that I shared with you yesterday. Um, I'm sharing the screen now. Um, so we go straight to our unit of analysis. Let's call it like that. It's to together understand what, are, what were those psychological barriers that limited evacuation decisions. So we're thinking of people who received an uh, evacuation message or evacuation alert during Dorian in 2019, but they did not act upon that. And as a context, we studied the local values and I would say tradition, uh, that tradition and historical uh, riding the storms. And of course, we found that in the first interviews and we had really interesting perspective from journalists that we talked to. And in their view, and we, we took that as a learning, this is a moment in which we are readjusting within Bahamas um, this narrative of storm riding, which has been historical and part of local culture, to the new evidence of new super storms like Dorian which brings a different type of uh, magnitude and, and destruction. So in that uh, process of adjustments, uh, decision makers, um, and also as risk managers, like when we take a decision, we are managing risk, we talked to a different groups in the society, in the community, on different islands affected by Dorian, who were there. Most of them, the people who did not evacuate, but some of them who actually did take the decision to understand not only the, the decision itself, but also the judgments behind those decisions. The judgments are the main ingredient behind our decision. What we take for granted when we say, okay, I'm gonna act upon this. This is a, and we see decision as a cocktail of judgments. And this is where most of the times we find biases and also where we find the opportunity to tap into, to make risk communications more effective. So let's see an example. Um, yesterday, um, Carlos described these bias, these systematic and predictable errors that we make. For example, the status quo bias, which is an emotional bias that shows a preference that we have for the current state of affairs, to do not make any change. And in the conversations, we found examples of that. And we, we think like, for example, Monica, he said, we always say, if it's category three, it's okay. And Dorian came as a three, but it intensified to almost a category six. But that, in a way, taking for granted that something that comes as a three will not affect me seriously, we find that as an example and a judgment. If we wanted to help someone make a better decision next time, we should focus on those judgments. Um, 
Of course, there are different types of um, status quo bias. Some of them may be connected to a religious view. The Lord takes, the Lord, the Lord gives, the Lord takes. God gave us his house, but if he decides to take it away, life goes on. And of course, with deep respect for all the religious values, it's important to understand the elements of status quo bias in decisions that may be maybe improved next time. And we discussed that with the pastors and from different um, faiths. So this is again um, an example status quo bias present in many of the conversations, which takes forms in different forms and, uh, and judgments. Um, this is an example of Amy, tourist from Colorado. A few judgments that we identify behind those biases. We don't want to cut our vacation short, or we felt we were there for a reason. We pray when we make when we need to make an important decision. So these are uh, important things that we identified in the interviews. And, um, and the biases behind. And one of the things that we found is that there's um, what we call um, a single option bias. It's the tendency to think of a decision in terms of just a dilemma of reducing the, the options that we have when we make a decision in a critical moment. So for example, when we live on a rock in the middle of the ocean, there's nowhere to go. Evacuation is not a viable alternative when you have assets and a business. And that's, of course, the judgments that is in line with Ken's values, protecting the, um, if I need to protect my assets and my business, then I don't have, uh, evacuation is not an option. Behind that, sci what science shows is that in moment of uncertainty, we make a simplified model of the world and we eliminate some of the actions based on our values, based on our cultural traditions, based on lack of our awareness sometimes. Um, and, and this is what psychology has shown. Um, and of course, we can we can we need to take that on board if we need to make race communications more effective next time. Then we also found in places where are isolated laterally, we talk to people, we're talking to people who are in distant islands and maybe you don't have available all the resources. We do find systematically the overconfidence bias, and which is a tendency to over overestimate my ability, my skill, my control on the on the outcome and positive and possible future outcomes. And we see it in examples of, I trust myself. I found out my own information. I don't need someone to come and tell me I need to evacuate. I, I, I built this house myself. I know it's safe. So it's like um, this feeling of overconfidence may be in many cases uh, affecting and driving decisions where there's a need to actually evacuate. But that's that could be considered a barrier, and we're seeing the judgments behind that bias. And also, science shows that we judge risk by how we feel about a potential outcome, how we feel about elements and the options in my decisions. And, and we also know that those emotions are what makes me transform information into real meaning. So when we analyze the willingness of people to evacuate to a shelter, we analyze how people felt about those shelters. And we have found that they are, it's connected and that perception is connected to trust in those shelters. If I'm not clear who is responsible, if it's not clear who's responsible for operating them, then, then I might not consider going to that shelter. Or so, um, Jim saying it's hard to trust the shelter. So my previous idea and how I feel about that option that I'm considering definitely affects the decision. So there's an emotional component on it. And in this case, an element of trust. And something that we found in the process is that um, values and judgments, those cultural elements and, the, and these um, biases are better predictors than the geography or, or the location. Even if I'm near the shelter, that doesn't mean that I'm going to go there. And, and one of the ju judgments behind going to the shelter is easy, but it's a problem of trust. They open the door to let someone in, someone in and then the roof collapsed. So, uh, the perception of the shelter and my willingness to evacuate was not connected at all uh, compared to our values, our judgments, and our biases, and our perceptions of those places. So this is another important finding there. And we also know that it's so much easier to destroy trust than to create it. And that's something that science shows. Um, and we know that, and we found that there's, um, there are important messenger effects. And, and that is, uh, as we saw yesterday, judgments on, on the way we interpret the message 
it's dependent and it's filtered down depending on how I perceive the messenger. And for example, lack of press or the, the perception of lack of presence in a particular island. And I'm talking about like the, the, how they perceive NEMA as a central government office. Um, that affects trust and that affects how different messages are interpreted. So uh, making sure that we build that brand and that it will continue to build and work on the attribute on the attributes on how people perceive me as a voice, as an institution, that definitely affects how people interpret the message when I tell them it's a time to evacuate, for example. Um, and again, when we analyze decisions, now that we know the outcome, now that we know how difficult and tough and serious it was, it's easier, and it could be an, an error on our side to understand it as a, only based on the outcome. Because when you understand like the real decision process over time, you can tell that it was like really difficult. This is just a simple version of a decision process of one of the people that we interviewed that initially decided to stay at home, but then based on the evidence of such a serious event, 12 hours after, or a bit more than 12, decides to move, but then doesn't consider the, the place safe and moves again and again and again during the eye of the storm, which gave him um, 45 minutes. So again, it's easy to analyze decisions as um, now that we know the result, but it's, it's been really complex for, for decision makers, for, for risk managers. So these are just one of some of the elements that makes uh, risk communication so difficult and so difficult to uh, make them effective. Most of the times we, think, we tend to think that it depends only on information, but it doesn't. It depends on the messenger, it depends on people's beliefs and values, it depends on emotional reactions, it depends on the way it's conveyed. And an, an example of that is that when it is conveyed. If it's too late for, for me to act upon that information, then I may interpret that information in a different way. Um, and again, I go back to this idea that we perceive risk in line with our identities, because this is difficult, very difficult to change. And we need to accept that if we want to make different type of effective communications, which in line with what we discussed uh, in Carlos' presentations, Marco's presentations yesterday, some, there's a potential to intervene and make interventions in the context. The use of music and music and songs as a nudge, it's just an example of interventions in the context uh, to hopefully make turn translate into more responsible decisions. So this is just an overview and I, I try to be quick there's lots of work, as, uh, as I know, uh, Yuri, but I hope to answer your question and, and share a bit of the story of what we've been through the whole year. Absolutely. Thank you very much, um, Emiliano. I think the, the, you're peeling, peeling back the onion for us in a way in the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the context of the Bahamas. And I think these insights, particularly um, the, the way you are describing it, uh, riding the storm, um, maybe up to a category three, or even the overconfidence bias um, in the outlying islands because of remoteness, I built this house, etc. I mean, these are very, very um, important insights. And I think um, a good foundation upon which, um, you know, the, the design of uh, communication uh, interventions um should should be based um so thank you for that and and showing us a little bit more about the complexity of the issues and the value judgments that people are making and the need for us to understand those a little bit better in terms of reaching out to them effectively to try to nudge them in in, in making uh, better decisions so thank you for that uh, moving you. on to to diana uh, uh in Ecuador, uh, tsunami and flood early warning systems are being developed through the IDB finance project. And uh, from the perspective of local government, um, I'm curious as to what is the significance of this project? What benefits have been obtained from the project? And what challenges do you think need to be addressed? So, Diana, please. Gracias, Yuri. Buenos dias, en primer lugar. Thank you, Yuri. And first of all, well, good morning. Well, in the case of Ecuador, the program for strengthening the early warning system for the tsunamis and river flows really has to do with uh, reducing risk disaster in uh, our country, because through this program, we've been able to 
adopt and include 2 million people into our early warning system with uh, the other components that we have involving the early warning system, this can now safeguard uh, this community in the case of uh, tsunami as well as floods. So what I can relate is that after the 2016 uh, uh, earthquake that took place near the coast of Ecuador that left uh, um, hundreds dead, the government then assumed the responsibility and it prioritized these early warning systems and mitigation and preventive systems that would safeguard and protect the community in the face of potential disasters. In 2017, an agreement was signed with the Inter-American Development Bank to finance the second phase of an early warning system. And after that, uh, the more resources were invested in um, the program. And with this phase two, we were able to expand the um, these mechanisms that extended to the um, provinces of Santa Elena, Oro, and Galapagos. And it was through this project we were able to reinforce the monitoring systems used by the scientific uh, institutes using uh, seismic and meteorological tools and um, we and and uh, technology we now have 136 sirens that have uh, camera technology with uh, robust and redundancies so that in case one of the systems fail then they can be taken up by other systems and then another component that's important in the early warning pro process has to do with uh, informing the community and strategic communication so in coordination with the uh, the local governments the local jurisdictions we have been able to create 83 community committees and within the process the first thing that we did was we raised a greater awareness among the community regarding the potential risks that they may be exposed to Similarly, we also have trained the community so that they can better respond to a potential tsunami, knowing exactly where the escape routes are, where are safe shelters and safe points. And uh, so as we created these committees, we conducted also emergency drills and simulations that we've tested. And with the creation of these committees, we um, for this, we have implemented the uh we provided new signage for escape routes and also for uh safe shelters and uh safe areas that they could uh, go to in case they need to evacuate the region they can access uh, this information uh, and know that they have these areas they can go to so as i indicated Every January 31st, the country holds national drills and simulations as a result of a recent tsunami, which took place, by the way, in uh, on January 31st, uh, 2006. And this drill, this exercise is focused on mobilizing the community, especially the, those living around along the coast. They implement what they've already learned about the uh, emergency routes that they should be aware of and safe shelters they could go to. So this has yielded very positive results overall. And we've identified, we, we realized that the population that participates in these drills, they usually are students and their public officials. In other words, these people, uh, are uh, because they're mandated to participate in these um, drills. They're, it's their obligation to do it as officials and students. So we have to go out and partake in these drills and we have to be made very aware of what we're doing. But we also began to see that the community in general was not participating in the drills. So the impact, although it's true that the country has made major strides in investing resources in these facilities, the early warning systems was still having a fairly low impact regarding the people we wanted to reach out to. And in the coastal areas, not only do we have communities that reside there, but we also have many uh, people who 
just go there for uh, holidays. They go to enjoy the beaches. So the impact has to be much more far reaching. So we identified this gap and working in cooperation with the IDB and with their support, we conducted a study that you were able to see the results uh, yesterday. And this focused on exactly what are the root causes? Why does the community in general, why haven't they been more engaged in these drills and simulations? And what steps can we take in government so that we can get a better idea as to how to improve the communi strategic communication process with a community? And, and perhaps, how could we better uh, implement in strengthening our early warning system? How can we implement communications, new communication strategies? So this study actually came at just the right moment because as a result of these um, discussions, we're all going to have uh, much more uh, relevant and timely interventions so that we can get their attention though and motivate the public at large so that they can participate more fully in the drills and we can reinforce the relationship so that they become familiarized with every component of the early warning systems including the sirens the new signage posts that we put up uh, indicating where the emergency uh, routes are so the study has really uh, shed a great deal of light on these things and we continue uh, moving toward that uh, result. Thank you, Diana. Uh, well, it's, it's very interesting uh, what you outlined. It sounds like uh, Ecuador is um, really embracing an evidence-based approach and the combination of the use of technology, uh, the drills, and then realizing some def deficiencies in communication and trying to seek to optimize that uh, communication outreach uh, to, the, to the beneficiary population. So I think very, very um, good example and, and nice to see the, the combination of technology and behavioral approaches um, and, and incremental, uh, incremental approach. So, so thank you very much for sharing that experience. Uh, over to Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo, uh, considering the challenges uh, pointed out by Diana, uh, the IDB is working with you also to improve the situation. And as in the case of the Bahamas, um, I was wondering if you could explain what approach you're taking in Ecuador and what are you finding out and what improvements are being proposed. Okay, eh, muchas gracias, Yuri. Buenos días eh, con todos. Thank you very much, Yuri, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In the case of Ecuador, our focus with the IDB has, uh, as Diana mentioned, we wanted to complete a phase two in the early warning system process. But the idea here is how can we improve and ensure that these early warning systems have a the meaningful impact that we're seeking. So I'm going to share this presentation. And please let me know if I've been able to share my screen, if you can see it. So, so the whole idea is to improve the efficiency of the early warning system that includes using behavioral sciences. This is a very new and uh, innovation, the idea of um, risk, disaster risk management to put behavior sci behavioral sciences into that equation. And we're doing it in Ecuador. And here the focus is how, well, first we'll look at how were we able to launch this uh, first pilot project. I'm not going to get into the specifics of the baseline analysis because Marcos uh, shared many of our findings yesterday. So my idea is to share with you the way that we uh, implemented this pilot project, the efforts we undertook. And I'm gonna brief briefly show the baseline. We're gonna look at the social experiment that was conducted as we uh, implemented these nudges as we call them. And then finally, we'll look at the uh, final results. So 
The framework of the study focused its objectives on analyzing the relevance and effectiveness of utilizing the concept of nudges within the um, early warning system, the building of these messages to serve as nudges. And then our focus fo focal point included five municipalities along the coast of Ecuador that had already installed the early warning systems. Another very important thing that we need to take into account in our pilot project, we had one major restriction, which was the COVID-19 pandemic. So as was mentioned by Diana, every January 31st, we hold these uh, national drills as a commemoration of the 2006 tsunami. But in 2021, we weren't able to conduct it because of restrictions imposed by COVID-19. And those were some of the um, unexpected changes. This is the area that was the focus of the study, starting with Atacames in northern Ecuador, all the way down to Santa Elena. These are five uh, municipalities with about 375 kilometers separating the two. It's a fairly large area. And we analyzed 39 uh, locations. And because it's an, in a coastal area, most of the people in the area focus on tourism, uh, different trades, as well as fishing. So these were the three fundamental aspects. We looked at, uh, well, the 31st of January drill was going to take place, but because of the, again, the COVID-19 restrictions, we decided to interview some of the uh, local officials. We met also with community leaders, and we also had 754 household surveys in various uh, municipalities where we work. So the first interviews with officials where we compiled um, information related to the SAT and the um, linkage of the, the communities. One of the first things um, in the implementation of the early warning system, we didn't include the local uh, government and the community, and we saw some problems with uh, some of the early warning systems, which included the um, evacuation routes, as well as the proper signage and mapping. So we got information about the previous drills, evacuation drills in the previous January 31st uh, years, going back to 2017. And these were the provinces where the early warning system was first installed. So they have a lengthier track record. Some of these communities had already been doing it for four years. But when we looked at the, uh, the fact that the, most of the people participating in these drills were either students or government officials. So we conducted 754 household surveys. And these surveys in five uh, municipalities were done in accordance with the um, local communities, which is we held, uh, we developed uh, various clusters, several square blocks where we selected 10 households to conduct these, uh, these surveys. So in each municipality, we determined randomly the square blocks where we would get the information. And in some municipalities, once we arrived, we we would see, for example, we, we had to make some changes. And we changed several uh, of the locations regarding the square blocks. But this is the, uh, the community, each one of the communities, as well as the uh, square blocks that we selected. Leonida Plaza is a very urban area with about 15,000 inhabitants living there so we gleaned the information basically using a survey with 60 questions and uh, marcos yesterday discussed uh, some of their findings and in fact they conducted some baseline diagnosis but there are some key factors that also helped us in um, designing the early warning and upgrading the early warning systems only four out of every 10 people uh, participate in the community in, uh, in these uh, drills. But most of these people were either uh, at school or they were working at the time that the uh, drills were taking place. This percentage was at home. 
So this was the segment that we wanted to encourage to participate more. We didn't take into account the tourists, which is another important consideration. And also looking at the how people get the message, how they get their information. And TV was the number one source, but we also saw that uh, social media, about 50% of those surveyed said they got their information through the social media, the use of what's up. Um, and this is one of the tools that we used, and we're going to be looking at that a little more later. 66% of the community that was surveyed use WhatsApp to get information. We also ask a question. We asked a question about the uh, early warning system itself. Do you know, we asked, do you know about them? Do you know, and about 50% said they were aware what it meant, uh, early warning system. Did they know about the tsunami warning systems? About 50% said they did. And do, we asked, do you know what a tsunami is? And the vast majority of those surveyed said they did. And then we asked, can you identify easily those uh, safe areas as well as evacuation routes? About 80% uh, said that they, they did. And we asked them then to draw the areas that they consider safe shelters and where is the uh, evacuation route? So we realized that about 81% and basically matched the um, and of the 60 questions, we conducted an analysis, and you saw this yesterday with Marcos, to get an idea about the, um, the gaps of information. And so again, we processed all this information and we looked at the biases, we looked at the barriers, and we came up with these four information related. The lack, for example, of information, tunnel vision, lack of information because of inertia. Um, also, we identified each one. We also looked at herb, uh, herd behavior, and we looked at each one of these so that we could propose a potential solution. Not all, for example, of the residents were aware about the time and the date that uh, drills were held. So we would have to provide periodic reminders for the community. And people felt that they didn't, that um, we, we asked that uh, they, um, to avoid this uh, message with a high emotional overload, we'd have to, uh, we, we called them to participate in order to uh, avoid the loss of, uh, of death. And we looked at we tried to define each one of these messages that were going to be disseminated through WhatsApp. And we accompanied these messages with audio and video messages. Let me just uh, share at least the audio message that we incorporate in our WhatsApp announcements. Okay. Entonces, como les decía, so esas... as I was saying, we post these messages and you can, you can see the WhatsApp messages that we uh, post. And also we provide these audio reminders, your attention on Friday, October 15th, 2021 at 1600 there will be a tsunami drill in palmar remember when you hear the early warning system alarm please go to the closest uh, safe area please inform your neighbors so we also include videos for example we would have the firefighters from uh, the community, we would ask the chiefs of the firefighters in each community in their jurisdiction to also record a video that invites the population. I am uh, Carlos Hermenegildo and I am deputy uh, chief of firefighters. 
on October 15th, 2021, at four o'clock, we are going to have a tsunami um, exercise and a drill. So when you hear the early warning uh, alarms, please go to your nearest uh, safe area. So with these packages where we targeted these, uh, we included uh, control groups, and then we sent one to one group that received one reminder and group two received all of the messages and uh, through WhatsApp, through audio, video messages, and the control group did not receive uh, any message. That was our, our experiment. And here we prepared the drills in all five uh, municipalities where we received a great deal of support and cooperation, including the risk management authority who were with us in organizing the drills. And with our consultant group, we were sending messages without the uh, organizers of the uh, drill uh, were not informed of this so that we wouldn't um, have any detrimental effect on the experiment. So the results were that three of the five drills were activated through the uh, emergency warning sirens. And in one out of three, uh, they did not adequately prepare or organize the uh, simulation uh, announcements. So we had zero people in that case evacuated. In the other two localities, with 191 households in our survey sample, 3.6% um, of the con control group participated, whereas uh, the treated group uh, received one point, they participated 1 1.6 of the time, one person. But the baseline in the exercise that we have here served us well to get a better understanding as to how we needed to address, how we needed to continue improving the uh, responses, looking at behavioral science. We got a better understanding the key components or got them to understand better the components of the early warning system. Now, in looking at the uh, behavioral sciences um, in the capacity for the community to respond, and we, we know that this depended on many other components and there's another there's another factor that we didn't take into account at the beginning but we needed to work on much more which has to do with the uh, behavior of regarding vis-a-vis -vis the authorities the technical staff so we realized that if the sirens aren't working and if if the we're, we need to, uh, again, improve the, and we need to review all of the early warning components, make sure that they're operating properly. This also has to be looked at. Working in the behavioral sciences context needs to go hand in hand with um, the uh, disaster risk management process so that they're in optimal conditions. And that way we'll be able to intervene more effectively with the community working and also getting in the, the tourists uh, aware and at the uh, local areas, we need to improve community participation and their response to early warning systems. So that's basically everything I wanted to show you. And I want to thank the uh, those responsible for undertaking this, these efforts and here in Ecuador with Adam Bermeo, as well as with the support and the advice of Marcos Agurto and Debra Lina and uh, Hori, who from the IDB were also providing a great deal of support where we again included the behavioral sciences as an innovative component in disaster risk management. And we believe that this is shedding a lot more light and providing a much better a more comprehensive understanding as to how to e increase the effectiveness of early warning systems and disaster risk management practices. Thank you very much, Ricardo, um, for sharing these important lessons from, from Ecuador. Uh, thank you both.
to you and Diana. I found the, the points on the dynamics of participation quite useful and particularly the combination of the use of the WhatsApp messages um, with the, the messages from, from, from the leaders. I think uh, it's, it's quite interesting and um, uh, congratulations on, on this effort. And you know, I hope that the participation in, increases and the, uh, the participation in the drills um, uh, in, increase and, and people take it up more, more seriously. Colleagues, um, we're, we're close to, to the end. I, um, I encourage you to make any questions that you have in the chat, um, if Danielle can help me with that. Um, but while we're waiting, um, maybe I can start with, with a question either to Emiliano or Ricardo. Um, after listening to, to your presentations, we, I think we all understand that behavioral science is an important perspective um, in developing public policies for disaster risk reduction to en enhance effect, if its effectiveness. But I think uh, it's important to be able to measure the effectiveness in order to widely disseminate it more in the future. So, so my question is, how do we need to, or how should we evaluate the effects of nudges? For example, should we look at what percentage of the number of participants could be considered a success uh, when compared to the number of people who, who were not exposed or didn't use the nudge? If you can let us know what you think about how, how maybe we should think about evaluating nudges, um, that would be appreciated. So I, either Ricardo or, or, or Emiliano, whoever wants to take a, a first bite. Well, I can... Go for it, unless Ricardo, you're going to go first. <laughs> no. Um, adelante, adelante, Milan. <laughs> of course. I think um, the way we try to approach it is to understand what are the actual behaviors and desired behaviors and try to see our interventions um, as a way of overcoming the barrier or the many barriers, right? So I would say that each of the identified barriers should have a measurement, at least one measurement, right? Um, in, the, in the projects that I presented, uh, one of them was, was the message actually ar arriving to its destiny? Was it reaching is the isolated community that um, deserves that message or is, needs that message? Okay, there's a measurement there. And the baseline is how many people were getting that message and how many people are getting, uh, are getting that message now. So this is maybe the, the first barrier. Then the second one is, uh, are they internalizing risk? And to measure that, you may need um, interviews um, just to see how they are reacting to that information. Of course, the most ambitious um, goal is to make people change the behavior. And yeah, uh, I would say that percentages to measure the amount of people participating in a drill, for example, uh, could be um, an a very important measure, measurement. And even if those changes are small, um, Ricardo may mention one of them um, in the presentation, um, if the nudge has, was low cost, it may be worth, I mean, you, you may be saving lives already. Um, so considering uh, the, the expectations of how much change do we want to make with a nudge, it should be also considered when, when you consider the cost of it. So I would say that one measurement for each barrier and for some of them, it's percentages, for some of them may be um, a, a semi-structured interview to understand how, how people are relating to your interventions. Um, and again, and, and the measurements are super important because one of the things that we learned is that these interventions change depending on the context. So you're expecting one intervention to be replicated easily in a completely different context, and that is not the case. So measuring the before and after in each context where you make an intervention is also key. Excellent. Thank you for that, Emiliano. I think the linking a measurement to the intervention and something that you introduce, which is really paying attention to the cost uh, as well, um, relative. I, I just wondered uh, if Ricardo had anything to add on, on that same question about yes. measurement. 
Sí, sí, el, el tema, a ver, voy a empezar con... Yes, con... I, I do. I will begin with the last one, the issue of cost. That is essential, particularly thinking about uh, the realities in our countries. The issue of a cost uh, over the initiatives that, that, that we might take in order to improve uh, participation in the specific case of early warning systems. So precisely seeing these uh, mechanisms of uh, nudges but low cost uh, nudges will make a difference. And these uh, will make a difference because countries uh, can be part of this uh, dynamic uh, in approving these systems. So we're opening up uh, a framework uh, to social sciences. And this has been uh, so much uh, discussed uh, by people involved in disasters and in risks. And we have to take a look at this from a comprehensive point of view. Therefore, I believe that it is important to work a bit more on this and how to measure this, as you were asking. Well, I don't know whether it is a participation in the drill per se, because the discussion has to do with the fact that the results have to show that maybe it is not so much the drill as such, the way we see it now, but an, evacu an evacuation exercise that, that is different than understanding the behavior of people as such. And so all of this... Um, makes us uh, understand that we not only have to focus, as I was saying at the end, on the behavior of people and only what they do. This is what I was saying. We also have to take a look at what they're doing, what the authorities and local uh, technicians are doing. And in connection with coastal areas, what tourists uh, do, because people work, you ask them to go through a drill, but you have uh, people in the restaurants, on the beaches, and this is how they make a living. So it is a much more for the exercise with Ecuador. It opened up uh, our minds. It uh, simply shed light uh, to continue working and looking for these answers that I believe uh, is something that we cannot not answer in a couple of minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Ricardo. Totalmente de acuerdo. Uh, we, we have uh, one, I think I just got the cue that we, we, we have to wrap up soon. So just uh, one, maybe one last question, uh, maybe probably to Diana. Um, I, I know that the, the nudges are attractive because they're maybe relatively inexpensive compared to other measures um, like building infrastructure. Um, but uh, it means that you have to acquire knowledge about other countries' experiences um, of designing or introducing nudges. So how do you think that Ecuador could acquire this knowledge in the field in the future? Yes. In fact, as you mentioned, for us as a country, this issue of the, the nudges is quite novel. It's quite new. And we're very grateful for this space in which we've been able to learn from what is being done in other countries, in this case, Haiti, and also what they're doing in the Bahamas. And I believe that this could be a good point of departure, the exchange of experiences, but also for us, as at the National Risk Management Service, we want to attain social innovation and uh, uh, having changes in behavior. And these are tools of investigating and understanding why this happens or why we have this very low level of participation and even to try to understand what is the relation between the population and the early warning system, how they see this, and not only in connection with the sirens, but in general, that they have a huge technological siren that has a signage. What is the relation with all these resources that we have offered as a state? For us, evidence is very important, precisely to improve the decision-making and the public policy. In that regard, we're also about to launch a national research and risk management agenda where we've included as one of the priority lines the issue of behavioral sciences, social innovation, and technological innovation, understanding that all these findings that we have will perhaps lead us to having drills developed in a different way, maybe dealing with the virtual immersion, virtual reality, as we see in other countries, that maybe leave the population with a much more live experience, understanding that they will be able to feel that they're participating, that they're involved in a situation of risks, and what are the alternatives that they have in order to 
deal with that. And we've moved forward on this. We have some simulators in Quito and also from the, the state we also have uh, seismic simulators, which are little uh, cars. So we've already taken these first steps, uh, but definitely through this agenda and these uh, networks of collaboration that uh, we will put together with other universities uh, and other international cooperation places and with the IDB itself uh, to be able to move forward and to evolve uh, towards that. And all that uh, we've done as a country during all these years in terms of preparing for the response. Fantastic, Diana. Thank you so much uh, for that response. Um, it's great to hear about the initiatives that Ecuador is proposing. So just to close um, I, I, and to recap, I think uh, you've all made some very important points, particularly on this last set of questions. Um, uh, Emiliano's point about context specific uh, measurement. Um, Ricardo's point about uh, the, the paying attention to the cost, uh, your, your point about research and communities of sharing and, and, and uh, building the knowledge in this becomes quite important. So I think there's quite a lot of, of room for, for work, um, which is very exciting. Um, but I think part of it is how do we structure this work to learn from each other's experiences, case-specific experiences, which we may then adapt and customize maybe uh, between countries. Um, so I just want to say a, a big thank you very much to the panel for your contribution and presentation today. I hope it's been informative for, for those attending. And uh, I, I turn us over back to Danielle. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank Yuri. You. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Uh, so thank you for participating. Um, OK, so now. We're going back to uh, Ricardo. Uh, I think I'm going back to Spanish for the moment. Uh, Jen, puedes proyectar, por favor? Esto para Could que you please uh, project this uh, so that Ricardo can tell us uh, what uh, this uh, exercise will be in the breakout rooms? He will explain how we're moving to the breakout groups. So let us uh, hear the explanation and then we'll move uh, to the breakout rooms. Uh, so, Ricardo, so we're back uh, in plenary and uh, we will be working on these uh, case studies and uh, these exercises and the groups uh, that uh, we will be organizing will have uh, an hour and 10 minutes uh, to work. And in each uh, breakout room, you will have a facilitator from the IDB and a facilitator from AHANA for logistic issues. Uh, should you have any problem with the tool? Although you've all worked uh, with this uh, tool yesterday, I hope uh, that you became familiar with this uh, tool and that it's easier for you to work on this uh, today. Based on the cases I proposed, uh, we will answer three questions uh, in three sessions, uh, devoting each one of these uh, sessions. Uh, we have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, and we will ask uh, the IDB facilitators uh, to be flexible. And if we take longer in one, uh, then we'll adjust it with the second one so that we can finish on time with these uh, breakout rooms. The next one, please. So that we can take a look at the exercises. And here you have the board that you will have uh, today. The first part that will be similar to what you did yesterday. And we will be working with uh, biases and barriers in order to determine how a specific exercise uh, will lead us uh, to this work of defining these uh, biases and even propose uh, some nudges in this exercise. And for this, we will be working in each group uh, with three case studies or three specific cases, uh, three exercises. The first one, the first case is uh, the case of Pueblo Lindo. This is a case, we're saying that the local government of Pueblo Lindo has planned to carry it out a flood, flood evacu evacuation drill with the participation of the population. The local authority has invited residents to participate in the drill through the town halls and notice uh, or notification board. The content of the notice is as follows. An evacuation drill will be held on Wednesday the 15th at 11 a.m. 
and all citizens of Pueblo Lindo are invited to participate. However, less than 5% of the city's population participated in this event. So in this exercise, the main question or the discussion has to concentrate on the issue of what makes the population not willing to participate. You will be able to see this from the point of view of the community or from, from the point of view of the authorities. And the elements for this exercise are that the early warning system for floods has to be the correct system in the best shape, the preparation of the drill and the participation. And now the second exercise is a case of País Verde Esmeralda. The Verde Esmeralda country, the coastal area of the Verde Esmeralda country was hit by an intense tsunami in 2001. The local government of Verde Esmeralda revised the regulation of land, land use law in the coastal area and declared it as non-resident zone in order to prevent tsunami damage in the future. Residents who lived in the region also received financial aid to move to other territories. However, Although they were informed about the danger that living in the unsafe area represents, more than 50% of the residents of the district have not left their homes and continue to live in the non-residence zone. So here, once again, the key question for the discussion is uh, what moves the population to continue living in these risk areas? And so, this has to be seen from the point of view of the community and the authorities. You have to consider the change in land use and the proposals of new residence zones, these services in these new areas and economic and social activities in which the population is involved. And the last case is the Las Maravillas country. In 1990, Las Maravillas country applied the earthquake resistant building code approving decree 001. This building code is the strictest in the world and its compliance has earned the country the reputation of a construction power since several buildings of more than 50 floors have been built. However, it is also common to build houses that do not respect the anti-seismic standards which cause the destruction of many houses in the following earthquake or the earthquake in the following years. So the question continues to be the same. What makes the population to continue without abiding by earthquake resistant codes from the point of view of the community and the point of view of the authorities? And some elements said to be considered are for this case, Please see it from the point of view of designs. We need engineers and architects on the construction permits that have to be granted by the municipalities on the construction itself and the control done by municipalities as well as a control and viability, the use of housing. These are the three cases we'll be working on, divided into five groups, and the groups are already so therefore, we ask you to please help us to be part of this dynamic. We will upload to the chat some support, the background documents for those of you who might need some guidelines or additional information on the biases and the barriers. So you have these documents that will be uploaded on the chat, but also we have the definitions as such. So this uh, document or this information is useful. We will be including them on the chat so that you can download the documents. And if you need uh, an additional question, you will be able to do it here. So without further ado, I believe that uh, we can now move on to the groups and uh, to begin our work uh, for approximately a little over an hour to see if we're able to have the expected results in creating some nudges and for you to see what this process is like, this work that we do with these behavioral sciences. Please go ahead with the groups.
Hola, buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos a nuestro grupo de trabajo número 3. Tenemos el gusto hoy de tener en nuestro grupo a Ricardo Peña Herrera también. Eh, Ricardo, somos suertudos de tenerte en nuestro grupo. Eh, y en conjunto con Marcos Agurto estaremos acompañándolos en el ejercicio de hoy. Tenemos un caso muy interesante eh, que vamos a, a proyectar, que será nuestro desafío de esta mañana. Eh, así que esperamos pues la participación muy activa eh, de todos nosotros para que construyamos un ejercicio sólido que nos sirva en nuestros países y en, nos, en nuestras regiones. Le doy la palabra a Marcos, quien nos va eh, a guiar eh, un poco sobre el ejercicio, sobre el caso que tenemos asignado a nuestro grupo. Y eh, luego yo retomo explicándonos de nuevo la herramienta rápidamente eh, para que estemos claros en lo que tenemos que hacer. Marcos, bienvenido. Estás en mute. Perdonen. Gracias, Clara. Buenos días, Ricardo. Muchas gracias. Gusto tenerte también aquí en el, en el grupo. Eh, bueno, eh, entonces, eh, Clara, ¿te parece si proyectamos el, el caso, eh, el, el, el texto del caso? Sí, claro. Lo, lo proyecto, ¿Quieres que lo proyecte yo? Vale. Con mucho gusto. Dame un segundo. Ya lo proyecto. Muy bien. Entonces, tenemos un caso de una situación en donde tenemos algunos problemas ¿no? para la prevención de riesgos por desastres naturales, que eh, es un caso edificio, y nosotros en este caso eh, tenemos que analizar la perspectiva de los pobladores, de las personas que son miembros de la comunidad, y en base a las discusiones que hemos escuchado el día de ayer y el día de hoy, identificar problemas basados en los sesgos del comportamiento que llevan a las personas a incumplir eh, normas, a construir de manera no adecuada, ¿no? a no prepararse de manera adecuada para desastres naturales. Bien, entonces eh, vamos primero eh, a identificar estos problemas. ¿no? Les pido que se pongan o ¿no? que traten de ponerse, que hagamos un ejercicio de ponernos en los pies ¿No? Eh, y en la situación de las personas de, estos, eh, de, esta, de esta comunidad, de este país ficticio, que podría ser una comunidad de Perú, de Ecuador, de Guatemala, de Bolivia, ¿no? eh, o de alguno de nuestros países de Latinoamérica y el Caribe, y que pensemos en razones basadas en los sesgos del comportamiento, en, 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 en las ciencias del comportamiento, que llevan a las personas a esta situación, ¿no? Entonces, este es el primer paso, ¿no? El primer paso es identificar los problemas que se relacionan a los sesgos conductuales que llevan a las personas a tomar las decisiones que, que vamos a mencionar, ¿no? Bien. En el caso se llama El País de las Maravillas. Eh, lo leo nuevamente para que todos lo tengamos en contexto. Eh, en 1990, el País de las Maravillas aplicó el Código de Construcción Sismo Resistente aprobando el Decreto 001. Este código es el más estricto del mundo y su eh, cumplimiento ha hecho que el país gane la reputación de potencia constructora, ya que se han construido varios edificios de más de 50 años. ¿no? Sin embargo, continúa siendo muy habitual ¿no? O sea, conviven este, en esta situación de, ¿no? de este estándar eh, a nivel internacional, al mismo tiempo, ¿no? En determinadas urbanizaciones, barrios, colonias, ¿no? Observamos que es muy habitual la construcción de viviendas que no se apegan a la norma, que no cumplen las normas sismo resistentes, ¿no? O sea, que se construyen de manera precaria, sin asesoramiento técnico, ¿no? En lugares no, no, no adecuados, eh, y esta situación originó eh, o provocó que en el sismo que sucedió en este país en el 2001 eh, x eh, una gran cantidad de viviendas colapsaran ¿no? o se destruyeran. A pesar de contar con la normativa, ¿no? esta normativa estudiada por expertos, el gobierno contrató expertos de diferentes universidades del mundo, de diferentes instituciones, se reunieron con los expertos locales, analizaron los tipos de suelos, ¿no? Eh, los materiales de construcción, las técnicas locales, y llegaron a esta 
a esta normativa, ¿no? Que ha permitido que hayan ese tipo de hijos. Sin embargo, ya eh, la, la, una buena parte de la población sigue construyendo de esta manera. ¿no? Entonces, lo que vamos a hacer ahora, eh, Clara ya ha compartido con nosotros el, 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 en el chat, pueden ustedes ubicar el, la pantalla, eh, por favor, si pueden ingresar al, al chat. ¿No? Sí. Si todos pueden ingresar sí. al chat, hay un link allí. Eh, si le hacen, si abren ese link, van a poder en, entrar a Miró eh, y ustedes pueden ver, ya los veo allí <risa> activados, ustedes pueden ver eh, varias secciones. Entonces, vamos a trabajar eh, primero, vamos a darnos un tiempito ¿no? eh, para eh, pensar sobre eh, esta pregunta, ¿no? Que está en el lado izquierdo. Eh, ¿tienen, el no, Tienen el caso allí, por si quieren ir a los temas del caso, eh, y vamos a tratar de, de, de enfocarnos en esta pregunta. ¿Por qué los residentes construyeron las casas ellos mismos, ¿no? Eh, y sin cumplir en los códigos de construcción o permitieron que los constructores lo hicieran? La perspectiva o punto de vista que vamos a asumir es el de los y, y pobladores, ¿no? El de la gente de esta comunidad, el ciudadano de a pie. Esa perspectiva vamos a, eh, eh, a tomar, ¿no? Y piensen, pues, en todos los problemas relacionados a construcción, ¿no? Eh, ¿no? No construyes en los suelos adecuados, en zonas inundables, con los materiales adecuados, compras materiales informales, no contratas un técnico, ¿no? O sea, pensemos en todos los problemas que se presentan en esta situación y tratemos de reflexionar sobre ¿Qué problemas conductuales hay detrás de esta situación? ¿no? Entonces, Clara, ¿cuántos minutos tenemos para esto, por favor, para esta primera parte? Tenemos 20 minutos. Bien, ya, entonces, a... vamos, ¿no? con, con calma, pensemos, reflexionemos, vamos a darnos 20 minutos, eh, démonos eh, 20 minutos para pensar y para trabajar y para ir eh, poniendo los, eh, los problemas desde el punto de vista conductual. Eh, Ricardo, perdona, no sé si tú por favor quieres aclarar algún punto o quisieras precisar algo. Creo que no. Creo que en ese sí, caso. Sí, creo yo también. Sí, sí me parece que se ha, se ha caído la internet de Ricardo. Bueno, no hay problema. Entonces, empezamos, por favor, adelante. Entonces, yo ahora me callo. Este... Y eh, los, dejo, los dejo trabajar. Vamos, vamos con calma. Si alguno de ustedes tiene alguna duda sobre cómo utilizar la herramienta, por favor me va avisando aquí en el chat y yo voy explicando. Pero veo que por ahora están todos muy activos, entonces les agradezco por eso. Para escribir, Clara, me parece que lo único que hay que hacer es doble clic, ¿no? Sí, doble clic encima del post-it. Eh, y van escribiendo su idea y el, el, la plataforma sola va cuadrando el tamaño de la letra y todo para que no tengamos que editar absolutamente nada por ahora. Exacto. Y recuerden que por ahora vamos a trabajar en la parte izquierda de eh, la pantalla de Miro, que es la que está debajo de la pregunta. ¿De acuerdo? No vamos a manipular las secciones a la derecha de, las, de estas dos barreras que se llaman sesgos y nada. ¿no? Todo lo vamos a hacer a la izquierda. Bien, entendémonos. Bueno, va corriendo el tiempo y, y en 20 minutos nos volvemos a
Ve, me, veo con mucho gusto que el tablero se va llenando muy rápido. Eh, Clara, si necesitan las personas que nos acompañan hoy postings adicionales, nos puede por favor indicar cómo los pueden generar. Claro que sí. Damos doble clic en un espacio vacío y ahí mismo se crea el, el post como lo acabo de hacer. Perfecto. Muchas gracias, Clara. Uh -huh. Y recuerden, perdonen que ya ven que no me aguanto dejar de hablar, perdonen que vuelva a insistir, recuerden, usemos los conceptos de economía del comportamiento, ¿no? Eh, es, esto es, base, es muy importante, pensemos en los sesgos que hemos ido identificando a lo largo de esta jornada de trabajo. Muy interesante lo que voy leyendo. Muchísimas gracias por tu participación. Si alguno de ustedes eh, quiere verbalizar digamos, lo que está escribiendo, si quiere eh, hacer preguntas a los demás colegas que están con ustedes hoy también para validar que en otras eh, regiones o países ocurra lo mismo, está bienvenido el diálogo entre todos nosotros también. Veo también que nos acompañan hoy 
y amigos y amigas de, de Bolivia y de Ecuador, pero veo también algunos nombres que no tienen el, las iniciales, y si pueden poner las iniciales, por favor, se los agradeceríamos mucho. Las iniciales del país. Clara, ¿cómo, ¿cómo vamos con el tiempo para esta primera parte? Bien, nos quedan cinco minutos. Veo que todavía seguimos activos en el grupo, así que... Sí, no, se, está súper chévere. No. Este, Creo que al contrario, bien. se nos está acabando ese el espacio para los post-its. Sí, sí, Estoy poniendo wow, por aquí no. al lado. Pero está súper chévere como uno puede, ¿no? una vez que descubre esto de la economía del comportamiento, uno piensa, empieza a pensar las cosas sí. de manera mucho más rica, ¿no? Porque obviamente el marco institucional, la gobernanza, la tecnología son importantes, pero nos olvidamos que las personas, eh, bueno, tienen estos sesgos, ¿no? En la toma de sus decisiones y hay que tenerlos en cuenta. Es muy interesante lo que voy leyendo. Bien, vamos, vamos terminando. Uh -huh. un, un minuto más y minuto cerramos es esta primera parte y pasamos a la segunda parte del ejercicio. Clara, en la, en la segunda parte te, te pido un favor, por favor, que mientras vamos teniendo la discusión me ayudes a mover los sesgos a la columna que corresponde. Claro que sí, Gracias. con mucho gusto. Gracias.
Listo. ¿Podemos, podemos empezar la, la segunda parte? Perfecto. Muy bien. Perfecto. Entonces, en esta segunda parte, lo que vamos a hacer es vamos a ir identificando las la respuestas ¿no? que ustedes han proporcionado. Vamos a ir leyéndolas. Y eh, en grupo vamos a ir asignándolas a los sesgos. ¿no? Los sesgos del comportamiento son, son muchos y tienen muchos matices y variaciones. Eh, el equipo del BID ha hecho un esfuerzo por identificar los sesgos más comunes que se presentan en estos contextos de gestión de riesgo de desastres. Y entonces vamos a ir leyendo lo que ustedes han puesto y con eh, su, su ayuda, ¿no? con la discusión del grupo, iremos asignándolos a eh, los sesgos eh, que se encuentran en las columnas del lado derecho. ¿no? Entonces yo voy a ir leyendo los sesgos, vamos conversando y Clara va a ir desplazando cada post-it, ¿no? eh, cada notita a la columna correspondiente. Uh -huh. Bien, entonces eh, vamos a empezar. Bien, perfecto. Entonces voy a empezar por la, la primera, la primera eh, fila de la eh, primera columna. ¿no? Entonces, eh, la persona que ha respondido eh, en esta nota indica que es una oportunidad de trabajar en familia y sentir el esfuerzo por tener una vivienda propia de todos los miembros del hogar a bajo costo. Me parece una, una respuesta súper interesante. Y yo les quiero preguntar ahora qué tipo de sesgo se esconde detrás de esta pregunta. Por favor. Adelante. Como somos pocos, simplemente pueden activar el micrófono y lanzar eh, la, la respuesta. Si se sienten más cómodos levantando la mano también. Pero como somos poquitos, podemos tener un diálogo de, sí, de ping-pong sin ningún problema. Adelante, por favor. Recordarles que a su derecho, si ustedes manipulan la herramienta, también tienen los sesgos que son más frecuentes, que hemos puesto aquí con los que trabajaremos hoy, que son miopía, optimismo, exceso de confianza, inercia, eh, simplificación, autojustificación, comportamiento de rebaño y escasez cognitiva. Entonces, también hay un documento en el chat con las notas y definición de cada uno, si quieren tomarse un tiempo como para validarlo. Eh. Sí. Sí, Entonces, quizá yo puedo ayudar un poquito y ahí hacer algunos recorda un recordatorio de definición para ayudar al, al diálogo que viene. No recuerden que miopía o sesgo al presente es que como personas tendemos a darle mucho, mucho peso al futuro, ¿no? A los beneficios futuros y poco a, lo, a los beneficios, eh, perdón, a los beneficios presentes, ¿no? Mucho, mucho peso a los beneficios presentes y muy poco peso a menos de que correspondería a los beneficios futuros. Recuerden que optimismo es que tendemos a subestimar la probabilidad de que nos pasen cosas malas. El exceso de confianza es que tendemos a sobreestimar nuestra capacidad de reaccionar de manera adecuada o de manera correcta, ¿no? Cuando pase, sabré qué hacer, ¿no? La inercia es que, uy, es muy costoso cambiar la situación actual. Ahí, ¿no? O sea, cambiar el status quo a las personas les cuesta mucho. Simplificación es, oye, mira, me han dicho que tengo que hacer todo esto eh, para protección de riesgo de desastre, pero ay, es que con estos dos pasos me parece que es súper, ¿no? Con estos dos pasitos de, los diez, de las diez cosas que me han hecho hacer, mira, si hago estas dos me siento que, ¿no? Me parece que con eso es suficiente. Autojustificación es, por ejemplo, ¿no? Oye, pues qué, qué mal que no has participado en el simulacro de este año. ¿Por qué? Si yo ya he participado en el simulacro del 2015 y ya sé qué hacer, ¿no? Justifico acciones malas por acciones buenas que he hecho en el pasado, ¿bien? Y comportamiento de rebaño o normas sociales es que las personas tienden, ¿no? A eh, conformar su comportamiento con lo que es la tradición, la norma social, lo que los pares hacen, ¿de acuerdo? Eso explicado de manera muy breve y muy sencilla. Bien, entonces regresemos al primero, ¿no? Que ustedes, eh, que, que uno de ustedes o una de ustedes había puesto en, en, en la respuesta. Es una oportunidad de trabajar en familia y sentir el esfuerzo por tener una vivienda propia por parte de todos los miembros del hogar abajo. ¿Dónde lo ponen? ¿Qué tipo de sesgos se esconde detrás de esta respuesta?
Me Oye, parece está, difícil. está fácil. Sí. Yo decía, podría ser eh, escasez cognitiva o comportamiento de rebaño, no sé. ¿Por qué Además, comportamiento de rebaño? O sea, eso lo veo más que nada en las, eh, por ejemplo, acá en las comunidades eh, rurales, tal vez es un podría llegar a ser un comportamiento de rebaño y, y ya también va de la mano con lo que decía, ¿no? que son prácticas también familiares, que se las hereda desde muchos años atrás, entonces lo ven como la oportunidad de compartir en familia con los vecinos a través incluso de tipo mingas y, y se unen para, para construir, entonces por ahí podría ser el comportamiento de, de rebaño. Interesante. Bien, yo creo, yo creo que es un buen punto, la podemos poner allí, efectivamente, es, la, es como todo el mundo lo hace, ¿no? Es como lo hacen todas las personas. O sea, y, y quebrar con esa tradición, con esa norma social, es, eh, es, es complicado. ¿no? Entonces podríamos ponerlo en comportamiento eh, de rebaño, Clara. Me parece Ajá, que, voy que llegando, una, voy llegando. Una asignación. Sí, hay que moverse ahí en la matriz. Bien, Exacto, la listo. Bien. Vámonos Perfecto. al siguiente. Muy bien, vámonos eh, al siguiente, ¿no? Se replican prácticas familiares desde mis abuelos, abuelos, padres que realizaban lo mismo. Se parece a lo anterior, ¿no? Eh, Pero no pudiéramos decir el... qué simplificación. Eh, yo... Por el hecho de poner replican prácticas, yo pensaría que es más como un status quo, algo que han hecho los familiares, entonces yo algo voy a hacer, me cuesta cambiar esas prácticas. Es interesante, ¿no? Me parece que es, que es interesante lo que señala Lorena Clara, en el sentido de que así hemos hecho las cosas siempre, ¿no? Es la manera en la que hemos hecho las cosas siempre. Entonces, yo, Clara, aquí me inclino un poquito más por el, lo que señala Lorena y, y asignar esto a, a esta cuestión. Perfecto. Por ahora, ¿no? Entonces, Perfecto, ya lo hago. Perfecto. Gracias, Lorena. Buen, buen punto. Bien, entonces, este, vamos ahora, permítame un poquito saltar, así, eh, eh, así vamos viendo también respuestas de, eh, de, varias, de varias personas, ¿no? Entonces, vamos a la, segunda, a la segunda columna y empecemos por la primera fila de la segunda columna, ¿de acuerdo? Eh, voy a leer lo que señala. Dice, cumplir el código de construcción es costoso, ¿no? Y no ven una ganancia futura mayor por hacer. ¿Bien? Cumplir con el código de construcción es costoso y no se percibe ganancia. ¿Con qué se relaciona esto? ¿Miopía o sesgo al presente? Yo eh, sesgo del presente. Sesgo del presente. Eh, estoy de acuerdo. Eh, yo añadiría allí quizá sale con, ha salido en lo, que, en lo que ustedes han escrito, no, efectivamente es costoso y hay otras prioridades en el hogar, no, es decir oye, si gasto más en poner mejores materiales para las bases, voy a tener menos en la sala para los acabados cuando tengo una fiesta, no o no voy a poder equipar la cocina no, o no voy a poner, poner el cable y el televisor, no entonces, eh, es esto de que es muy costoso, obviamente también está relacionado, no hay que dejar de vista que está relacionado, que hay otros beneficios de corto plazo que pueden aparecer como atractivos, ¿no? Como, oye, mira, el, la sala tiene que quedar bien porque hay un evento, oye, mira, y sí, podemos también tener un televisor y podemos tener el cable también, ¿no? Entonces, sí, en lugar de eso... Eh, lo invertimos en, en algo que además es muy distante, que no sabemos si también qué pasará, si nos afectará a otros, ¿no? Además, un, un terremoto no, 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 no va a pasar mañana, ¿no? Y las, las personas. Entonces, yo efectivamente también coincido allí y lo pondría en sesgo al presente, ¿no? Eh, falsa percepción de ahorro al no construir con los códigos de construcción. quería de la mano con lo que estábamos hablando el no ver un algo a futuro sino lo que quieren es ya tener una casa donde vivir eh, resguardarse lo, eh, 
o sea, una fiesta, como ustedes decían. Eh, pero más a eso de acabados, yo pensaría que es el tema de algo, algo ya, porque al cumplir con normas, se tienen que se demoran más, tienen que pedir más permisos, tienen que hacer eso, ¿sí? cuando por lo menos acá en Ecuador es así. Entonces, ese sería... También al lado de miopía, entonces. ¿Sí? ¿Están, ¿Están de acuerdo? No lo escuché, disculpe. O sea, también iría entonces al lado de miopía. Sí, sí. Perfecto, ok, muy bien. Vamos, vamos a, a, a seguir para poder este, para poder este, déjenme, eh, déjenme eh, ir también par, en varias de las, en varias de las pistas, ¿no? Entonces, eh, vamos, déjenme seleccionar ya acá está el reducir costos, ¿no? Ok, miren este de aquí, me parece súper interesante, en la cuarta fila, segunda columna, ¿no? Me parece bastante interesante. Dice, aplicar al mínimo la normativa constructiva implementada en el país. Sí, eso suena tan ¿Sí? colombiano, que es lo mínimo eso que suena es lo mínimo que podemos hacer para, para pasar esta cosa. Ok, y entonces, a ver si la persona que ha puesto esto nos puede ayudar un poco a, 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 a dar un poquito más de detalle. ¿Quién lo escribiría? O por lo menos yo que no soy eh, del área de ustedes, me estaba imaginando un ejemplo, Marcos, más como el ejemplo que hacen mis hijos, no sé, para aquellos de acá que tienen hijos, sobre todo adolescentes, que andan haciendo cálculos de cuál es la mínima nota que tienen que sacar para aprobar eh, el curso de fin de año. Entonces, necesito 2,7, entonces eh, sobre 50, estudian para el, el 2,7 en lugar de estudiar para el... Para el 50, no sé si más o menos esa era la idea. Santiago está levantando la mano. Adelante, Santiago. Sí, Santiago, adelante, por favor. Santiago, te escuchamos. Hola, ¿me escuchan? Sí, te escuchamos, Santiago, adelante. Perfecto, mil disculpas, estaba con el micrófono desconfigurado. Estaba no hablando. hay problema, no hay problema. Listo. Bueno, ahí un poco me refería a, a la parte su, justamente de la simplificación, ¿no? porque eh, tratamos de, de, de utilizar o de hacer el mínimo esfuerzo, considerando en este caso el ejemplo ¿no? de que el país ya tiene su, su categoría de, de, de tener buena, eh, buenas técnicas y normativas para la construcción. Entonces, la gente también eh, se, se confía y pues intenta hacer lo que lo que mínimamente puede hacerlo. Igual, por ahí había un comentario también que, que me parecía que va complementario a esto, es que igual, como no nos van a controlar, como no va a haber una, una, ningún tipo de, 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 de restricción en el, si lo hago en silencio, si lo hago, eh, listo, construyo, reduzco precios, no pasa nada, a la final no va a, a, a darse ningún evento. Entonces, eh, un poco la simplificación, esa actitud de, 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 de hacer el mínimo esfuerzo, eh, sí nos complica, yo creo que es un tema cultural ahí, bueno, un poco más eh, entrando a detalles, pero en, a eso me refería en este, en, este, en este caso. Gracias, Santiago, buen, buen punto. Eh, no sé si alguien más quiere añadir algo aquí, eh. Yo estaba pensando mientras estábamos esperando que participe quién era, eh, sobre la eh, autojustificación, ¿no? Porque si viene el gobierno y te dice algo, dices, no, pero yo he cumplido, o sea, he cumplido el mínimo, pero al menos he cumplido. Entonces muestras como que has hecho algo, no lo suficiente, pero eh, dentro de todo has intentado cumplir las normas. No sé si estaría bien. Sí, sí, me, no, me parece, me parece claro, yo... Por ejemplo, también pensando en el contexto de Perú, que se parece mucho al contexto también latinoamericano. Perdón, yo me callo porque Marta ha levantado la mano. Marta, adelante, por favor. Sí. 
Gracias. Eh, bueno, acá en Ecuador también sucede lo mismo. Eh, muchas veces no, no solo depende de la persona que va a construir, sino de la persona en la que se confía para la construcción. O sea, la, el, el técnico, el ingeniero, el arquitecto o el maestro, como lo dicen acá, eh, le dice, no, mire, eh, no, hágalo solo así y mire que eso va a ser suficiente. Y también le va a ahorrar dinero, o sea, eh, va el discurso ahí. Entonces, eh, es también ese tema, o sea, porque las personas normales no tienen el conocimiento, bueno, las personas en general, no creo ser normales, las personas en general no siempre tienen el conocimiento del tema de construcción, de obra, además. Entonces, nosotros confiamos en un técnico que puede ser cualquier otra persona, como ya lo comentaba, y a veces también depende de eso. Ese es un tema interesante, ¿no? Porque aquí yo creo que se conjugan, Marta, muy bien. Aquí, ese es, y esto me gustaría resaltarlo, ¿no? Y un problema, muchas veces detrás hay varios, ¿sí? ¿no? no necesariamente se relaciona con un centro en particular, ¿no? Por ejemplo, el tema de los maestros de construcción, ¿no? O sea, oye, yo siempre utilizo un maestro de construcción, ¿Para qué necesito un ingeniero, no? O sea, ¿para qué necesito un especialista si los maestros son los que construyen las, las, las casas aquí en la zona, no? Puede haber un tema de tradición, son los maestros los que se encargan de eso, ¿no? Eh, y el, yo iba a mencionar, a, cuando hablábamos del tema de simplificación, a, por ejemplo, lo siguiente, ¿no? Oye, este, ya, no, mira, yo tengo, le he puesto los mejores materiales, ¿no? Buen cemento, buen ladrillo, ya cumplí y el maestro la construye. Eh, ¿Ingeniero? No, ¿para qué? Es decir, reduzco la seguridad, por ejemplo, a la calidad del material. ¿No? Y, eh, y, no, y no necesito un especialista. O muchas veces es, oye, el primer, la, el, la sala comedor la hacemos bien, y bueno, ya y en el, una vez que hay cumplido allí, el resto de la casa se va terminando como es. ¿No? Es decir, vamos, vamos simplificando los pasos. Pero eh, podemos ponerle simplificación, creo yo, eh, clara, pero tengan, tengan en cuenta que muchas veces detrás de una situación hay un, podría haber eh, más luces. He visto Perfecto. que Char había levantado la mano. Eh, y, sí, Shari no. Shari, ¿estás ahí? <risas> sí, buenos días. Qué gusto estar con ustedes, unos expertos. Verá, lo de simplificación pareciera adecuado, pero también hay otro tema. Acá nosotros llamamos la viveza criolla. Esto es, la viveza criolla se refiere a como hacer trampillas. Suena feo, suena muy feo, pero eso se aplica mucho. Eso era todo. Gracias. No sé cómo, cómo sería el sesgo allí, cómo se llamaría, la verdad. Sí, no, el tema, a ver, es, es, es muy importante tener en cuenta que la economía del comportamiento captura solo una parte de los elementos de este proceso. Es decir, no va a solucionar todo el tema. La institucionalidad, por ejemplo, ¿no? la gobernanza, tener instituciones capacitadas, transparentes, que hacen supervisiones, ¿no? que, que, que regulan la construcción, también es importante. No solamente con un empujoncito se va a resolver el problema de, 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 de preparación de riesgo de desastre. ¿sabes? es importante que esto vaya acompañado de una buena institucionalidad y de buena calidad de instituciones encargadas del proceso, ¿no? Y lo otro, y esto lo resaltábamos ayer, los empujoncitos no van a reemplazar institucionalidad y no van a reemplazar educación, ¿no? Y institucionalidad y educación generan cultura, que es como tú señalas, un elemento bastante importante, ¿no? Entonces, no es una solución mágica lo de los Natchez. Eh, complementa, ¿no? Complementa el trabajo y puede ser de ayuda en determinados contextos. Pero no es la solución comprensiva, ¿no? Es Marcos, parte de... En, en virtud del tiempo, yo creo que vamos eh, haciendo un par más para que nos movamos ya a la última Sí, perfecto. Parte. Ok, ¿Vale? perfecto. De, okay. Vamos a ver. Déjame ver algunos que podrían completar en los... Este, eh, en... En... Había uno que acá, ¿no? Entonces, por ejemplo, ¿no? Se subestima la probabilidad, esta es segunda fila, tercera columna, ¿no? Se subestima la probabilidad de que ocurran eh, sismos, ¿no? Entonces, este, eso también es, ¿no? Oye, sí, mira, pero ¿cuándo va a pasar un sismo o una inundación? Poniéndonos en el caso de una inundación, ¿cuándo va a ser la siguiente? 
¿no? Ahí hay un tema de optimismo también y podríamos ponerlo para el lado de optimismo, eh, Clara. Y eh, vamos a ver, no sé si alguno de ustedes quiere sugerir uno de, de los que han escrito aquí. Eh, Miren esto, ¿ah? me parece súper interesante. No, ya pierdo el número de la columna, perdonen, pero ya terminando, en la penúltima, eh, hay uno que dice, soy desplazado por la violencia de mi país, lo que quiero es simplemente tener una casa, ¿no? Un techo propio. ¿No? O sea, a ver, miren, señores, saben que todo bien con su normativa y todo esto, pero mis urgencias son otras, ¿no? ¿Qué, ¿Qué piensan de esto y dónde lo ubicarían? También ahí hay otro que se relaciona, ¿no? Un poquito más arriba hay un comentario, dice, apenas, apenas pude conseguir un lugar donde vivir, no tengo los recursos necesarios, ¿no? Podría ser inercia. ¿Inercia en qué sentido? En que efectivamente, o sea, no tengo más opciones, entonces como que sigo lo que me viene, digamos, como, como en el día a día. Ve, 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 mira, lo que me importa es el corto plazo, ¿no? Ahí oh, ver, también miopía. Uh -huh. El corto plazo, no inercia, uh -huh. me cuesta, ¿no? Pensar, eh, entrar en esta decisión. Pero ahí hay un tema que es importante también resaltar y es el caso del sesgo cognitivo, de, de la carga del estrés relacionado a pobreza. ¿No? El día a día, ah, claro. las uh -huh. urgencias del día, la experiencia personal de, de, de violencia, de exposición a violencia, a vulnerabilidades, afectan la capacidad que las personas tienen para enfocarse en problemas relevantes. Oye, mira, te voy a explicar cómo hay que construir bien. Mira, mi cabeza está en otra cosa. Mi cabeza está en hacer el día, en ganar algo de dinero y enviar a mi familia que se ha quedado en la zona de violencia o en la zona vulnerable. ¿no? Entonces, este podríamos dirigirlo. Al, eh, al, a los sesgos por, eh, lo hemos llamado, perdonen para hacer bien el, el, para llamarlo de la manera, lo hemos llamado ¿no? escasez cognitiva, ¿ok? Que está, que está al fin. Bien, este, vamos a dejarlo aquí, el tiempo lamentablemente siempre es el tiempo, eh, y entonces vamos a tratar de ahora pensar en empujoncitos. ¿No? Para algunos de los sesgos que hemos, eh, que hemos identificado. Entonces, yo les pregunto, por ejemplo, va, tomemos el de simplificación, ¿no? Eh, que es aplicar al mínimo la normativa constructiva, ¿no? O sea, basta con los materiales, no es necesario el ingeniero, ¿no? Basta con las columnas, las paredes pueden ser de ladrillo informal, ¿no? Basta con el primer piso que lo haga el ingeniero, el segundo piso que se haga como sea, ¿no? Entonces ya el, la, lo importante es el primer piso, ¿no? Este, eh, tomemos el de simplificación, ¿no? Eh, que las, no, la normativa es compleja, implica una serie de pasos, ¿no? ¿Cómo ayudamos a las personas a, eh, a ver, a ver, ¿no? Y a implementar el proceso, de, el proceso completo. ¿Qué empujoncito les podríamos dar? Tal vez se podría dar una, una compensación económica, una, un, algo que permita justamente que, que si cumplen con todas las normas tienen una una compensación de alguna manera, un descuento en impuestos o cosas de ese tipo. Empujoncitos basados en incentivos monetarios. Esto es súper interesante, Silvana, y se ha empleado en la literatura para varios temas. Por ejemplo, te comento que en el año 2011 la Premio Nobel de Economía, Esther Duflo, hizo un programa en, en Pakistán en donde a, la, a los papás que llevaban a, su hijo, a sus hijos a vacunarlos Pronto, lo antes posible, les daban un kilo de lenteja, ¿no? Es súper barato, ¿no? O sea, es, gastas más si la enfermera está en la posta y no va nadie, ¿no? Es más costo eficiente dar el kilo de lentejas por vacunación porque eso implica que el costo de la enfermera se distribuye entre más vacunas. Y me parece interesante, 
¿no? Es decir, oye, si tú eh, cumples tú con los pasos completos, eh, tienes una compensación económica o algún tipo de bono beneficio. ¿Qué problema debes a esto? Que cuando se termina la compensación económica, la gente se siente estafada o empieza a pedir más o no sé. Un caso que pasó acá en Ecuador, en Guayaquil, cuando hubo, empezamos el tema de las vacunas, la alcaldesa de Guayaquil empezó a ofrecer, empezó a dar, ¿no? O sea, dio canastas eh, con, con víveres básicos a las personas que se iban a vacunar, creo que era la segunda dosis, no recuerdo exactamente. Entonces, llegó un punto en el que, bueno, la gente empezó a ir, recibía su canasta y todo, pero ya llegó un punto en el tiempo en el que ya no había las canastas, o sea, porque era un tiempo limitado, por así decirlo. Y la gente empezó a decrecer el tema de las vacunas porque ya no habían las canastas. O la gente iba y igual se vacunaba, pero se iba quejando porque no le habían uh -huh. dado su canasta. Entonces, eso, eso es uno, un problema bastante frecuente. Es, es un punto interesante, ¿no? Cuando los incentivos económicos se han usado y se usan, ¿no? ¿Ah? Eh, alrededor del mundo. El problema está en que hay que ser muy cuidadoso porque efectivamente si puedes generar una situación en la que al no estar el incentivo la gente deja de comportarse de la, de la manera adecuada, ¿no? Y otro tema que es importante, me parece sobre todo en países como Perú, que es un país de, de pocos recursos económicos, es el tema de la sostenibilidad, ¿no? Es decir, hay muchas prioridades, hay pocos recursos, hay que poner los recursos en los lugares más importantes, salud, educación básica, ¿no? Y generar incentivos para diferentes tipos de programas podría generar pues, un presupuesto demasiado amplio y no sostenible económicamente en el tiempo. Es un muy buen punto. Se pueden usar estos incentivos, pero hay que mirar todas las aristas. ¿Qué otra cosa podríamos hacer para que las personas vean los... Para que, ¿no? Oye, no es materiales, es materiales ingeniero, ¿no? Eh, es materiales y buenos planos hechos por un buen ingeniero. ¿Qué más podríamos hacer? No sé si es empujoncito, pero lo que se ha hecho en algunos países eh, es eh, capacitar a los albañiles también, es decir, decirles que a cambio de que construyan bien eh, o antes de que construyan se les va a capacitar para que justamente puedan aplicar las normas, porque uno de los problemas que, que yo, yo puse ahí es, también es que muchas veces la normativa es como muy compleja y, y tiene que ser como traducida a un lenguaje mucho más, más común, más habitual para, para los ciudadanos también aceptando la realidad que tenemos, ¿no? O sea, no, no creo que vamos a poder eh, eliminar ese tema de que, de que el maestro mayor sabe más que el arquitecto y que el ingeniero civil, pero más bien es reconocer esa, esa realidad y a partir de eso iniciar unos procesos de, de capacitación a, a los albañiles y, y también incluso podría ser a los propios arquitectos de ingenieros civiles que muchas veces también el, el trato que les dan a, a los albañiles o al maestro mayor también no es como nada adecuado. Excelente, muy bien. Y acá hay un tema de, o sea, tú estás yendo al tema Malas, de esa, ajá. Hola. ¿Alguien había, alguien estaba hablando? Me, me parece, perdón, me parece muy bien lo que señalas. Uno sí, podría... Sí, mira, sí. La, 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 las normas, y aquí estamos viendo, ¿no? Al norma social, la norma social implica que es autoconstrucción con los albañiles de la comunidad, ¿no? Eh, viendo el proceso y tú podrías, tú estás sugiriendo un programa de capacitación de albañiles, ¿no? Entonces, uno podría pensar en empujoncitos para que las personas, por ejemplo, eh, usen albañiles certificados o contraten albañiles certificados, ¿no? ¿Cómo ponemos en su cabeza la importancia de... Mira, es buenos materiales y un buen albañil certificado. ¿no? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo diseñamos empujoncitos para que las personas, eh, con un albañil certificado, siempre, tu, ¿no? siempre en tu casa estarás cuidado? ¿no? Tipo de, mens de mensajes de este tipo, a través de difusión en redes sociales, o a través de mensajes de texto, ¿no? o a través de comunicación de, eh, de la municipalidad o del responsable. ¿no? Eh, ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo asociar, no? Que no basta con la, con la calidad del material, es importante el profesional calificado, y tú has dado en el punto, ¿no? De que en muchos casos hay que entender el contexto, no todos van a poder construir quizá con un especialista, pero es posible la capacitación, ¿no? Y, y dar los estándares adecuados eh, al, al, a, los, a los albañiles de la comunidad. Puede ser una opción en determinados contextos, me parece 
importante de recibir. Marcos, sí. ¿qué te parece si nos vamos, justo que tenemos al lado, a inercia para tratar de construir unos noches ahí también antes de que se nos Perfecto. El, el tiempo? Muy bien, sí, perdonen, es, es que la, 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 la conversación se torna interesante. Es interesantísima, tienes bien. razón, el tiempo Bien, corre. entonces, vamos a inercia, ¿no? Se realizan prácticas familiares desde mis abuelos, padres, ¿no? Que, que hacen, que, que vienen haciendo lo mismo. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo quebramos el estatus quo? Ya esta no es fácil, ¿eh? yo aquí, sí. a mí me, me, ¿cómo, cómo, ¿no? ¿Cómo ayudamos? A la, ¿no? Si esto es, si, y, y es que además esto se, se refuerza por normas sociales también, ¿no? O sea, esto es, oye, es la manera de hacer las cosas, en, todos los, a todos lo hacen así, ¿no? Todos lo hacen así, es la manera de, 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 de construir, eh, ¿cómo, ¿cómo salimos? Pueden enfocarlo, eh, Clara, de, de, dejemos lo que lo puedan enfocar desde el punto de vista de inercia o desde el punto de vista de normas sociales, ¿de acuerdo? En, bueno, con es, como, como parte de que algo yo observé en algún tema, eh, ayuda mucho el tema de educación, tanto educación a la población en general, tanto como educación... Eh, Mientras las generaciones van avanzando, la educación va mejorando para cada una de las generaciones. El mismo conocimiento no tiene el abuelito, al mismo conocimiento no tiene el papá o el hijo. Entonces, uh -huh. el tema de educación en diferentes líneas es una parte en donde puede ayudar mucho estos temas de tanto de inercia o conocimiento ancestral. No, de, de, o... de acuerdo, la educación es un factor importante y nos ayuda a avanzar ¿no? en el mediano y largo plazo. Yo quisiera que puedan hacer el esfuerzo de pensar en medidas de empujoncitos que nos permitan ir avanzando también en el corto plazo, ¿no? A cambiar este sesgo de las personas que dicen, oye, sí, la normativa y todo esto, y luego dejo de pensar y de seguir razonando, ¿no? De razonando en esa dirección, y, 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 y mi cabeza me lleva al sesgo, ¿no? De mirar al costado y decir, oye, pero si todos lo hacen así, ¿no? Si mis vecinos lo vienen haciendo así. Obviamente, eh, educación nos va a ayudar en el mediano y largo plazo, y, no, y los, los empujoncitos no reemplazan eso. Pero en el corto plazo, ¿cómo nos pueden ayudar a la medida que vamos avanzando también en el proceso educativo? Santiago, perdona, no había visto la mano levantada. Adelante. Eh, tranquilo, Marcos, muchas gracias. Más bien, este, bueno, lo que, lo que se, me, se me ocurre en este, en este paso. Eh, bueno, yo creo que nosotros tenemos algunos sistemas que están bien marcados, ¿no? Al menos en los temas de gestión para la construcción, ya que estamos en este tema. Es, es, son procesos muy antiguos, son procesos que, que la mismo, el mismo servicio público lo tiene marcado si no, no existe un, una renovación desde ahí, ¿no? Entonces, eh, la gente lo que hace es eh, memorizarse los, los, la gestión que tienen que hacer y con eso, pues, ya cumplir con su construcción. Ahora, lo que, lo que en, este, en este paso lo, se me ocurre es eh, justamente crear como que ese acompañamiento dirigido a las, a, a las personas que están en, en este proceso de construcción y eh, darles todas las herramientas, inclusive quizá ir paso a paso acompañándoles para que primero pues tengan un buen diseño Segundo, tengan uh, una selección adecuada de materiales. Eh, y tercero, pues ir con un checklist, pues revisando cada uno de los procesos. Porque a veces hace, eso hace falta, ¿no? Entonces, eh, así se rompe la cadena de inercia de, las, de la gestión que tienen que hacer las personas para los, los procesos de construcción. Y se les va dando ya un proceso innovador en el que ellos pueden incorporarse. Y además de eso, van a tener ese acompañamiento técnico de ahora, obviamente. Ya si nos vamos a la realidad, qué, qué complicado es dar seguimiento a cada una de las construcciones, ¿sí? a cada uno de los servicios, pero este, ahí está justamente el romper este, este, esta, este mecanismo de inercia. Gracias, eh, Santiago. Yo, yo quisiera traer de, de, otras, de otras situaciones un par de ejemplos que quizás se podrían acomodar. ¿no? Por ejemplo... En Bangladesh, para promover el uso responsable de mascarillas bien puestas, 
que hubo un grupo de familias que aceptó tener en sus puertas ¿no? un signo de yo soy responsable con mi comunidad, ¿no? yo cuido a mi comunidad, yo uso más. ¿No? Entonces, por ejemplo, y eso, ¿cuál era la idea? La idea es promoviendo poco a poco una cultura de construcción responsable. ¿no? Entonces, podríamos, a través de líderes comunales o familias responsables, se podría ir ¿no? generando una cultura de yo construyo seguro, ¿no? yo cuido a los míos, yo construyo de manera responsable. Pues, obviamente, suena muy simple, pero hay que pensar en, hay que pensar en el contexto. ¿no? Como empujoncitos que promuevan. O, o, o ayuden a eh, señalizar comportamiento responsable para poco a poco ir cambiando eh, la norma social. Y luego lo otro, y está relacionado con lo que tú mencionas, Santiago, es que muchas veces el proceso es complejo, ¿no? Y un empujoncito es hacerlo fácil. Oye, ¿cómo les hacemos fácil a las personas no acceder, por ejemplo, a un albañil capacitado? ¿Cómo les hacemos fácil a las personas que el, el plano... Eh, que están proponiendo se estudie pronto y se apruebe pronto, es decir, hacerlo fácil. Ese también es un empujoncito. Cuando nosotros nos paramos frente a una computadora a llenar un formulario, el formulario tiene ocho o nueve páginas, lo primero que hacemos es, ¡ah! en la próxima semana, ¿no? se nos pasa completamente. Pensemos ahora en personas con otras, otro tipo de situaciones, en barrios vulnerables, en zonas vulnerables. ¿Cómo se los ponemos fácil? ¿no? Entonces, un empujoncito podría ser un sistema que haga a las personas o les permita acceder de manera fácil, identificar fácil a albañiles capacitados, por ejemplo, o, o, o a ingenieros voluntarios, o grupos de ingenieros voluntarios, y también que les haga fácil ¿no? el proceso de registro de una vivienda segura en la municipalidad. ¿no? Hacerlo fácil es un, es un match que ayuda a las, ayuda a las personas. Y, ¿Cómo estamos de tiempo, Clara? Nos quedan cinco minutos. ¿Te parece si vamos a optimismo o a miopía? Para a miopía. Que... Vayamos, sí. a, vayamos a, mi, a miopía. ¿no? Perfecto. Que dice, cumplir el código de construcción es costoso. ¿no? Es costoso. Hay otras cosas de corto plazo que son más importantes. ¿no? Oye, ¿para qué? No? Mira, no va a pasar. ¿no? Un, material, eh, un material barato porque... Eh, hay otras cosas que son más importantes ahora, en los electrodomésticos o el colegio de los hijos, ¿no? Eh, hay que mandarlos a un colegio particular y entonces entran otras, otras cosas que también son relevantes y tienen impactos de, de, de corto o mediano plazo y el terremoto tiende a verse distante. ¿no? ¿Qué podemos hacer aquí? ¿Cómo hacemos que las personas sientan los beneficios? Les pongo la pregunta de otra manera, ¿no? ¿Cómo hacemos que las personas sientan los beneficios de viviendas seguras hoy? No sé, igual lo que he visto en otros lados es que utilizan como unas maquetas eh, igual para demostrar qué es lo que ocurre cuando no se usan las, las normativas estas shaking table eh, y de esa manera como que se concientiza a la, a la población también de qué, qué sucede cuando no y qué es lo que pasa cuando sí, sí se considera. Me, me parece súper interesante ¿no? visualizar el, lo que pasa cuando hay un terremoto. ¿no? Oye, te va a pasar algo. Me parece que eso iría un poco más conectado al lado de optimismo. ¿no? O sea, visitar a las personas en las comunidades y mostrarles qué pasa con una casa como la de ellos cuando está construida mal. ¿no? para que vean que les va a pasar algo. Lo, lo de miopía, los naches de miopía, están más relacionados a ayudar a las personas a percibir los beneficios ¿no? de estas medidas de prevención ahora. Y una, una forma también que pasó acá fue cuando fue el terremoto del 2016, si no me equivoco el año, perdón que se me cruzan un poco las fechas, es... Eh, enseñar o visualizar qué pasó en las zonas o en los puntos ceros, o sea, la, cómo cayó los edificios, eh, la fatalidad, suena feo, pero a veces la gente necesita esa impresión fuerte para, para ver, oye, si tú no construyes como tienes que hacerlo, te puede pasar eso. Nadie esperó ese terremoto, nadie supuso que iba a pasar, nadie dijo, ah, no, es que aquí no va a pasar eso. Y cuando de la nada sí pasó, 
Entonces, eh, esos puntos en donde la población sintió son como que puntos de sentimiento que se pueden aplastar mirando un video o algo que sea observable y que lleve un mensaje a lo, de lo negativo hacia lo positivo. Gracias. Eh, yo, yo también relaciono eso también con el tema de más por el lado de optimismo, ¿no? De ver, hacer de ver a la gente el, el, el daño, ¿no? De lo que, que pasa cuando ocurre un sitio con un exceso de confianza. Eh, Lorena, adelante, por favor. Eh, para este caso yo creo que estaría más relacionado a lo de la compensación monetaria, porque por como ejemplo, estamos costos y beneficios, creo que si se le da un beneficio porque está logrando cumplir, entonces ya no lo va a ver como tan costoso, no estamos reduciendo el costo en ese caso. Por ejemplo, ¿no? eh, si tú registras tu vivienda segura en la municipalidad, tienes un descuento sobre el impuesto municipal. Por ejemplo, ¿no? un pequeño NACH, ¿no? tienes un descuento sobre el impuesto. O si tú construyes tu vivienda segura y está aprobada, entras a la lotería de viviendas seguras del, del Estado. ¿no? O tienes algún tipo de beneficio de compensación. Eh, o si tú eh, construyes una vivienda segura, en algunos lugares puedes trabajar con el sector privado para que con esa certificación los seguros, ¿no? Seguro de salud, ¿no? Pueda también tener un descuento, ¿no? Porque obviamente la persona está mitigando, mitigando su riesgo. Me parece que estos empujoncitos basados en pequeños incentivos monetarios, ¿no? Eh, descuentos en los, en los impuestos municipales, eh, o, por ejemplo, el establecer una lotería municipal para aquellos que construyen seguro eh, podría, eh, podría ayudar. Me parece, que es, me parece que es interesante. En algunos países del mundo, a las personas que cumplen o establecen pues, acciones de seguridad para proteger a sus viviendas de, de inundaciones o de terremotos, eh, se les da eh, beneficios relacionados, por ejemplo, a la seguridad, eh, al, perdón, al seguro de la vivienda y beneficios también relacionados a los impuestos municipales. Eh, buen punto, buen punto. Eh, Clara, ¿cómo estamos? Uy, ya estamos a punto de, de terminar. Bueno, eh, un minutito. Sí, bueno, yo, yo creo que han hecho un, un excelente trabajo. Me, me, me ha gustado mucho leer los problemas y ver la manera en la que vamos pensando poco a poco, ¿no? En cómo estas situaciones presentan sesgos cognitivos. Eh, como decía Carlos el día de ayer, este, esto de la economía del comportamiento puede ser un curso de un semestre, ¿no? Y diseñar los, los nudges o los empujoncitos eh, no, es, eh, no es fácil. Y hay que tener en cuenta que muchas veces estos empujoncitos pueden hacer, hazle a las personas la vida más fácil y sencilla. ¿Quieres que construyan de acuerdo a la norma técnica? Hazles fácil el acceso a la norma técnica. Hazles fácil el acceso a, eh, a, 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 a eh, artesanos o a constructores capacitados. ¿no? Y lo otro es también, y, y esto está un poco reflejado en lo que eh, ha presentado Emiliano, hazlo también divertido. Es decir, oye, ¿cómo hacemos que esto puede formar parte de... de de una cultura donde la comunidad se siente muy satisfecha y alegre de cumplir eh, con los mecanismos de protección. Pero bueno, eso ya va quedando para reflexión y espero que pueda profundizar sobre el tema. Muchas gracias por su participación. Gracias, Clara, por la ayuda y nos vemos en la sesión. Gracias a todos por la conversación. En América Latina y PCS está bien ahí ya. Lo coloco ahí de fondo. No, lo voy a sí, colocar. Bueno, bueno. Estamos de vuelta, ya estamos de vuelta. Oh. Lo ponemos ahorita entonces. Sí. Bueno, bienvenidos de regreso. Ya estamos todos acá en sesión plenaria nuevamente. Sigue estando session. grabada. We are now recording again. Y estamos acá listos para arrancar. We're now Cada ready to begin. Each group, we have five groups, by the way. Each group selected their spokesperson 
I hope we, I hope you have you have your representatives. So let's begin. Um, let's go to. Let's look at the uh, some of the results. Let's go back to Pueblo Lindo. We would like to hear from the groups that worked in Pueblo Lindo. Each group will have about four minutes to very quickly just provide your conclusions. What kinds of nudges did you come up with? group which was the this the english speaking group uh, do you have a speaker hi Who's the Daniel, speaker yeah. for this group okay i am chloe, I am the speaker. Hi, hi, chloe. Yeah. how are you <laughs> okay so we're hi. in your hands you have three three to four minutes to tell us what you found okay so as you mentioned the problem or the the, the case we were presented with pueblo lindo it was the, the fact that they did um, they, a drill about a possible flood and only 5% of the population showed up. The question is why? And uh, we had a brainstorming season and a brainstorming where we, we thought about all the possible explanations from ranging from people facing real barriers and not being able to attend and people just not wanting to attend, right? And we decided to focus on overconfidence and on inertia status quo. On overconfidence, we saw things like, well, my property will resist the flood. I built my property. I know it's strong or I know what to do. I've participated every single year on board. I've done it before. Um, I had, um, I know what, it's basically that I know the, the, what to do. I know where to go, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the nudges that we came up with was, okay, maybe we can tell personal stories. Because when we you say like big numbers of these many people lost their houses, it doesn't resonate. When you, when you tell a personal story, you print a poster with a face on someone that lost their house and they can share a story. Uh, it, it goes much to the point, right? Telling them about real cases and, um, and, um, and that's something. Um, also, another very interesting that we were discussing is if you, if you attend, you will learn something new. We put a lot of attention to that. So what is that something new that you can learn? So, so you know, nudge them that way, like they're, they're going to get curious. What's, some, what, what's that that I'm going to learn? Um, also, we thought about telling them, we want to hear the story about how you built your house, how you, you made it safe. So that would bring the overconfidence people to the meeting and, and share what, why they think their house is strong and safe. And maybe you can tell them why it might not be a safe or what other things they can do to, to build their strong, to, you know, to have a safer house. On the inertia, we thought that a lot of times people, you know, they're at home, they don't feel like going. So what are the incentives you can provide? Some incentives go towards, you know, like telling them um, maybe there's going to be some coffee. So it's going to be something interesting, something fun. It's not just about doing the drill. It's about building community. Everybody's going to be there. So if you tell them all your neighbors are going to be there, they're more likely to join. Um, also, we discussed harder incentives like there will be a raffle. And, but also there are some drawbacks, right? Because you, you want them to be there because it's important, not only be, just because of a potential prizes and if there's a prize it should be aligned with, um, with um, um, the goal of, of the meeting, right? Um, and another announcement, another thing that we thought of is make this easy to people. So some people would complain, oh, I don't, I don't know what to do with my kids. I don't want to participate. So giving the idea of this is going to be kids friendly, bring your children and bringing that fun part could, could go a long way. Also, we thought of maybe having a small concert with um, someone in the community at the end. So it kind of becomes a party uh, and you bring everybody to the safe place and it becomes kind of a party and they remember what that safe place is. So those are some of the ideas and nudges that we came up with. I, I hope you found them interesting. 
Excellent, excellent, Chloe. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Okay, ahora vamos al equipo número dos. El equipo número dos. Let's go on to group uh, two that we were working with, and uh, we know we have a spokesperson for that group, Jacqueline. Well, we identified, for example, some of the, the um, we had various biases such as uh, sim simplification, uh, and there wasn't a well-structured prior planning with these activities. So if you don't plan and the uh, drill is uh, unfolding if we don't plan well we're not going to get the expected uh, results and what we said in our group was that communication per se is crucial it's not just a question of informing the public that there's going to be a drill that's just not enough but we have to also focus on how we're conveying the message and the channels of communication we're using in some situations, you may have people who can't read and write. So people need to understand what the dates are, what time we're going to be doing the uh, drill. And again, we need to be able to reach out our target audience when we're planning these. Another aspect is that, that we need to plan for is that we need to look at not just at the actions that are, are scheduled, but we also need to plan our target community. We need to identify the proper language. We need to identify their level of uh, background education. Do they have any prior information or familiarity about the uh, safe areas, places where they can uh, find, they can evacuate to the evacuation routes themselves? And do they, are they familiar with this? Are we just assuming that they know it? In the case of Guatemala, are we assuming also that they're all they all speak Spanish? Maybe they can read and write, but maybe they don't speak the language or we think the majority speak it or the majority are they can read and write. So our checklist focused on how we can assure ensure that the way we communicate this information, we need to make sure that it's the, the message is as straightforward and easy to understand as possible. If we begin to create very complex plans, 40 page manuals for a drill, it's very likely people will say, no, I'm, I can't read all this, I'm too, I, I can't do it. As opposed to having, again, a checklist, a steps checklist, that, so that on one piece of paper, on one page, people can know exactly the steps they need to follow in a drill. What are the actions and responses they need to be able to give? So these are some of the focuses and um, incentives, creating more easy, straightforward information. Also provide micro incentives. When we conduct these processes, we uh, ultimately, people think, that they're not getting anything out of it. They're participating in a drill. And I just, what after that, what do I do? I go home. I didn't really do much. And there, so we talked about that. It was so, it was so important to create, create these small incentives. So once somebody participates in a drill, they should get some sort of maybe a memento, a, um, to commemorate that they did it, maybe a, a pin, or some sort of um, item that um, rewards them for having participate, participated in the drill. And also they need to feel a sense of belonging. They're, they're part of the actions that are giving their community an up, upgraded status. And again, these small recognitions are very important so that people can uh, feel a sense of accomplishment when they've um, participated in these uh, drills. And again, providing easy to read, the straightforward uh, messages. We have to avoid too complex a message. They've got to be straightforward, specific, easy to understand. And again, provide these uh, recognitions, R recognize what they've done participating as a sense of giving them a sense of accomplishment. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. 
let's now move on to our third case study. And I, we're going to have a representative from Bolivia as the spokesperson for Group 3. Yes, thank you. I'm Lorena Heller, and I'm from Bolivia. So in our case, it was uh, Wonderland, País de las Maravillas, basically Wonderland. So we looked at the construction code. And uh, have, however, the residents in that community don't uh, follow some of these procedures and uh, standards. Why have many of the uh, residents in the area not abided by the uh, adequate construction codes? So we began to see some biases. We saw, for example, it was very expensive to build uh, earthquake proof, proof houses and following construction codes. There was a false perception that uh, they were saving something significant by not building in accordance with the uh, construction codes. Or we, we had others that felt uh, inertia bias that had to do with the herd behavior. And because of it was a tradition that my parents, grandparents, great grandparents lived here with the same types of dwelling, the same types of construction that's traditional. And my ancestors have lived that way, so I can live that way as well. And also, th there were many steps that had to be followed to achieve uh, these standards. So we're going to do just the minimum possible. That's the uh, the simplification bias. Then the final one is, again, the herd behavior patterns. Since my family, my ancestors have done this, it's good enough for me, and it's always worked for us. I don't want to have to transition now to abiding by new construction codes. And applying these uh, standards would be very uh, time consuming and expensive and a, and a great bother. So they're only concerned with their immediate needs and they're not really thinking or looking beyond those immediate needs. So we proposed uh, several responses. In the case of the short-sighted approach, people were not quantifying the future gains and advantages. So we decided to provide monetary compensation for those who meet with specific um, and also, we could also give them tax rebates and uh, discounts. If they follow these uh, construction codes and standards and procedures, they'll, they'll get a monetary incentives. Then other certifications that could lead to rebates or other benefits. If they fulfilled, for example, the uh, standards, they would be allowed to uh, enroll in a lottery where they could win prizes. We also talked about these. We also needed to uh, create a better, a stronger message showing exactly what their potential losses could be from these uh, earthquakes. Now, when we talked about addressing inertia, we needed to conduct uh, awareness raising campaigns so people could become much more focused and aware about the benefits that they could derive from abiding by the construction codes. And again, this would address the um, simplification bias. If people have a user-friendly uh, step to uh, achieving these and transition to abiding by these construction codes, then we could uh, reduce the likelihood of poor construction. Also, maybe provide with um, references and access to adequate brick masons and carpenters so that they could build better, not just rebuild, but build better. Thank you very much. Let's now move on to group four. We have a representative from Argentina who will be the spokesperson for group uh, four. Well, in the case of our group, we also worked we worked with uh, wonderland but also looking at the um, construction uh, 
support why do the issuers not um why don't they fulfill construction codes for building houses so we looked at two biases we looked at the bias of inertia people who just don't want to bother following all these steps and uh, they also were comfortable with the status quo so they were complacent and something with a little more weight a lot of issues that had to do with a lack of knowledge or awareness a lack of awareness or knowledge about the construction codes that the process could be too uh, um, complicated and so these are all discouragements a lack of systematized information a lack of proper training by officials and government officials in how to better discuss and disseminate these construction codes and advantages so these you can we we know that the period of time that of transitioning to the new construction code is lengthy and time consuming so we saw as i mentioned earlier again people are complacent and uh, they didn't want to transition to a new way of seeing things and doing things they were used to the tradition and also looking at the be heard behavior if none of my fellow neighbors are doing it they're not complying with the construction codes why should i and the um some may some of the authorities might think or might, might think that um, people are now abiding by it when they're not so that's basically what we identified in terms of the uh, biases. Now, looking at the nudges that we took into account and given that the key, the key bias was uh, in ignorance or lack of information. So we created, uh, we decided to create platforms, tutorials, instructions on how to download this information from the tutorials and the steps that need to be taken through an app where you could provide reports um, in a more structured manner and also recognize people who are doing this and and also give information about um, the um, available uh, builders and certification processes. We also talked about having uh, tutorial videos that would include people who are well known in the community in the construction field and um, explaining in very simple, simple way why it's important for people to build in accordance with the construction code using means of persuasion that uh, well sound structures will save lives and reinforce the idea that the code needs to is already public and is well known and has to be well known by the public the public needs to be aware of the existence of the code and they can use it so that they can apply it effectively so that's basically in summary what we were working on in our group thank you daniela and now we have our final group group five who they're ready vladimir ferro vladimir ferro from peru will be the spokesperson for group five we can hear you yes go ahead thank you well based on our discussions we looked at in, in the case of Esmeraldas, people did not feel they had received adequate support during their when they were affected by a tsunami in their community. So there is a lot of insecurity within the community. And they, again, were concerned about um, their their uh, houses were again were were how they were going to be rebuilt there was a lot of uh, uncertainty and we also know that many of the people there are working in the uh, fishing industry 
So we identified, uh, and they were concerned about their future job prospects. So a lack of self-confidence, and there were other issues as well. But what we saw, and it was important to take note, that we need to be able to improve our strategic communications to um, to convey clearer messages and disseminate not just uh, the potential loss, a physical loss, physical assets, but also when you have a tsunami, that can be a completely devastating uh, event. And then we also discuss or hit home the uh, economic losses that uh, like we saw in the case of uh, Peru, where the fishing industry was uh, severely hit with a loss of uh, their resources and assets, including boats. And something else that we uh, saw, well, we wanted to convey a dual message in this community. If people <clears throat> are leaving, but you also have benefits in remaining. And we discussed that the fact that there are many people who live in poverty and, and the tsunami is one more terrible event in their lives. So we need to provide them with a, another another outlook a development outlook to increase their self-esteem and because to do that the authorities need to conduct on-site visits and help them rebuild to provide them not just rebuild but build back better providing schools better infrastructure in building back and that the government will be providing services and resources. So this would make the community feel that they have a stake in a staying and a continuing their development, the community development as a part of the strategy. You, there needs to be a focus on those, those young people who could be champions of uh, <clears throat> rebuilding and affecting change. Those people, now we know that people who want to relocate, that usually takes one to three years. And this, we need, we need to also disseminate success stories about those that have built back, uh, rebuilt um, with success that will encourage their neighbors, their family members those that have uh, many strong ties to their communities. And then another important factor to consider is that we need to establish dialogue with the communities, maybe in the schools, create dialogue where we raise a greater awareness with children in schools. And also, provide children with what their potential opportunities are in the future if they stay in that community. These are based on some of my experiences with events that we faced, but we have had a lot of success in raising awareness with children. In children are much more disciplined when they process information and they'll, ta they'll tell things the way they really are when they talk about risks and they also can serve to uh, spread the word at home with their families. <clears throat> so all of that is going to reinforce the community, the families, and, and make any relocation efforts more effective and uh, seamless. Okay, so that's basically what uh, we, we're hearing some interference from mic some other microphones that are on well i'm finished that's basically what i wanted to uh, to convey thank you very much vladimir so with that we've finished with our group 
discussions, their conclusions. Hopefully they've been uh, very uh, useful and I think very enlightening at the same time. So now I'd like to offer the floor to the person who has spent uh, so many, so many days and nights to carry this out. I'd like to offer the floor to Ori, who was uh, tasked with organizing this event. Go ahead, Ori. Thank you, Daniel. I am Ori Suneki, and I just wanted to wish you all a good morning or a good afternoon, depending on where you are. I cannot believe that this is the last session of this event. It's really moved so quickly. And I've also learned a great deal from this. I hope you also did as well. And I hope it's been a very useful activity for all of you. As a coordinator of this event, I'd like to thank all of you once again for your participation. And for all of you who stuck with us right to the end, I uh, just wanted as an observer to just say I found many of these suggestions and recommendations to be very interesting from the various working groups, things that we really had not ever thought of. So it's been a really rewarding experience for, for me. And I want to thank you once again for having attended this event and for sharing your uh, participation perspectives and participating in this. So the objective of this dialogue and this session, and we have, uh, this is, uh, I put, we're posting this up just to provide you with uh, some more information. The I, This is not the end with this one event. The IDB can now continue, it's just the beginning. The IDB can continue working with you in this area. And there are three key takeaways that I want to share with you. What we're seeing here on the screen, this uh, IDB web page, first of all, looks at how can we access the content related to this event here where there's a link that allows you to access the information. And here in this site, you will find all of the pertinent information relating to the event. You have videos, you have the agendas, you have presentations, as well as other documents that were presented and reports. We also included a recording of this uh, session all the materials are going to be available here. And yet, we need to include some of the other content that uh, we've been working on now. So we ask that you wait uh, a couple of days so that you'll get everything. And please let us know if you have any problems uh, accessing the contents here. So let's now move on. Let's continue. Now, this is the second uh, and very, uh, the, really the most important uh, takeaway from all of this. I just wanted to talk a little bit about how the IDB can support you in this field in this area after the event. The IDB is here as an organization to help you and support you. And again, we work through, uh, and through cooperation mechanisms. And your requests in terms of assistance, especially looking at the behavioral sciences, this I think uh, is going to be based on your requests that will be most welcome. As you know, the IDB works at in two levels. We provide uh, loans 
And we also work through uh, cooperation mechanisms. The IDB will would welcome discussions about uh, any future projects, either either through loans or technical cooperation uh, initiatives. And we can, uh, we basically would work through your country, regional or country offices, establishing these contacts uh, would be our first step. And you have the uh, links to the, through the country offices and also here through the screen. Now, of course, if if you're not sure about how to get in touch with the IDB, you can get in touch with me personally or with uh, Sandra or Erica, and we'll be more than happy to serve as your initial point of contact in these areas. So that was the second takeaway. My third takeaway is that here we have a link for the online course. These are the uh, behavioral economic uh, and economics courses. And Carlos uh, mentioned this yesterday. For those interested in enrolling in these courses and learning a lot more about the uh, contents. So I, I urge you to take advantage of these resources in terms of uh, training opportunities. So basically that's all that I had that I can uh, provide you with. And personally, I hope that I, my, I or the IDB will get the opportunity to better serve you. So that's all we had. And again, thank you very much for your participation in this event and being with us right to the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ori, for having organized this uh, magnificent uh, event. And now to conclude, I'd like to offer the floor to Luis Manuel just for some final thoughts. Thank you, everyone. Very briefly, I feel that um, this has been an extraordinary event. These policy dialogues are the channel, the uh, way through which uh, the bank can optimize their communication on the discussion of uh, public policy on different issues. As you know, we organize uh, policy dialogues on all the issues uh, covered by the bank. And this is an extremely important topic for us. Uh, it has been a very rich dialogue with a lot of content and contribution on an essential issue, such as the behavior when dealing with natural disasters. So on the contrary, thank you to each and every one of you. I don't know whether my colleagues will give us a possibility of opening up the cameras and taking a picture so that we can keep it for this event. But if we cannot do this in any case, Thank you very much. Please visit the bank's webpage, follow us. We always have the possibility of posting and sharing results from this event and other similar to this one, which might also be interesting for you. So nothing left to, to say, but thank you, Hori. Thank you to Renee's team for trusting us. Thank you, Ahana, for being a wonderful partner in all of this. Thank you to all participants for having stayed. It was impressive that we had almost the same number of participants throughout the two days, in spite of the fact that it was a long event, but you were there, present, really committed to this event. So thank you very much. Follow us and we will continue keeping you informed. Thank you very much and Merry Christmas to everyone. If we don't see you, we have two weeks left before the beginning of the holidays. So thank you for being with us today. Merry Christmas, everyone. And let's play this beautiful piece of music. And then we'll take the music and we'll take the picture. 
If you want, we'll open up the cameras and we'll do this after the video. We'll take the picture. If you can open up your cameras and then you click on gallery view and then we will take a picture. You have all the cameras there. So really good because it will be a great picture with all participants. So thank you very much. I don't know whether anyone from Mahana can take the picture. Really good. Thank you to all our specialists from the IDB who were with us at the speakers everyone who was with us for these two days. Thank you very much. I see all of you, the pictures being taken with the HANA team, with IDB. There's several pages full of open cameras. So that's really wonderful. Thank you very much. Happy. Gracias. Musica, maestro. Chao, chao. Gracias.